Dean Prosper Portland Board of Commissioners meeting is now convened. Pam, could you call the roll for us? Commissioner Platt? Here. Commissioner Gambetti? Commissioner Moreland Capuya? Commissioner Myers? Here. Chair Cruz? Here. Thank you. All right, we'll start with uh, Commissioner Reports. Commissioner Platt, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, just a couple things in the last couple of days. Um, yesterday, Tuesday the 13th, um, I intended a meeting at um, Hacienda CDC um, in negotiations with Mercado tenants over their new lease agreements. Um, and today in the morning uh, at Mercado, attended a um, key bank uh, commemoration event, um, awarding some money for our um, micro enterprise programs. And uh, some of uh, Prosper Portland staff were there. So it was really nice to see everybody. Well, great, thank you. Commissioner Myers? I also don't have very many to report. I have one. <laughs> Today I uh, attended the mayor's press conference, uh, keeping our streets uh, safe this weekend. And uh, it was great. a great event and uh, great leadership on the mayor's part. Great. Well, I have a light, light report this month too. Just uh, attended a meeting with Kimberly uh, with MISO, uh, and uh, we're still working on that. So anyway, more to, more to report there. Okay, Executive Director Report, Ms. Brown. Good afternoon, Chair Crews and Commissioners. Um, in light of the packed agenda, I'm going to focus on five uh, key partnerships and projects that hit major milestones this past month, uh, note a couple of upcoming opportunities and events, and then introduce our newest member of the team. So um, the first event that I wanna mention is that on July 12th, I had the opportunity to speak along with City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty at the launch party for the Black American Chamber of Commerce. Prosper Portland is proud to be a founding partner organization and we support the organization's mission of enhancing, educating, and empowering the local African-American business and professional community. So it was a great celebratory event. On July 12th, I joined City Commissioner Yu Daly, Transportation Director Chris Warner, and Gateway community members to celebrate the completion of the Halsey-Widler streetscape improvements. Prosper Portland's staff led the initial planning and engagement for the project to create a pedestrian-friendly main street to support safety and business along the retail corridor. We, and we contributed 1.6 million in Gateway TIF district resources to the $5.5 million, um, $5 million PBOT led project. On July 20th, I participated in the official grand opening celebration for Alberta Commons. All six of the Alberta Commons businesses located at the intersection of Northeast Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard and Alberta Street are now open. I wanna acknowledge Cole and Dana Reed, uh, Mr. Kaysen and Jamal and Christina Lane who relocated their businesses to Alberta Commons and spearheaded the celebration as well as all of the staff throughout Port, uh, Prosper Portland who contributed to this event and to the project itself. I also wanna invite anyone who hasn't yet gone to Alberta Commons to check it out. There's a fabulous array of businesses there and you can get many of your needs and uh, wants met there. Um, so you can learn more at alberta-commons.com. Uh, alberta on July 23rd and 24th, I joined the stakeholder advisory group's deliberation on the proposals to transform two properties here in Old Town Chinatown. I'm very pleased with the outcomes and you'll hear more about that shortly in the presentation. But I just wanna acknowledge and express my sincere appreciation to the stakeholder advisory group um, who spent a lot of time both interpreting all of the community engagement that occurred and the um, culturally specific opportunities that we had to hear from the community and ended with two consensus recommendations. So it was a fabulous effort by our consultant, JLA, and by Bernie, Eric, and Talia and our team to come up with what I think will be ultimately great projects, but the process was also really sound and represented our values. And so I'm excited to share more with you um, about that. And finally, on August 1st, I joined City Commissioner Nick Fish, Park Director 
Adina Long and Executive Director David Porter for a groundbreaking event to celebrate Leech Botanical Garden's expansion and improvement work. Among the ma many improvements that I'm personally very excited about is a um, aerial tree walk. So that's mm -hmm. coming forward and will be open next summer. Prosper Portland contributed $2 million in Lentz Town Center TIF District funds to the project. And um, if you haven't visited Leech Botanical Garden, it's long been referred to as the hidden gem. I think that's gonna change with some of these improvements, but definitely go, go check that out. You can find out more information at uh, leechgarden.org. So looking forward, we wanna make sure that local startups are aware that applications are open until Sunday, August 18th for a spot at either the Portland Incubator Experiment known as Pi, which is an early stage startup accelerator or Pi Shop, which is a collaboration between Pi, Autodesk, and Uncork Studios, which is focused on creating an advanced manufacturing and prototyping incubator to support the next generation of product companies. Rick Terosi and the entire team have intentionally focused on um, recruiting the most diverse pool of startups as possible, and we are proud of our ongoing partnership to support this work. In addition to encouraging folks to um, put in their applications, I wanna acknowledge and congratulate Pi on the milestone of its 10th anniversary, which will be celebrated tomorrow uh, evening. You can go to pipdx.com for more information on Pi and on the application process. And please mark your calendars for two terrific annual events put on by the Neighborhood Opportunity, by Neighborhood Opportunity Network Partners. The Jade Night Market is back Sunday, I'm sorry, Saturday, August 24th, and again on Saturday, August 31st. You can go to jadedistrictnightmarket.org for more information. And the Division Midway Alliance Festival of Nations is happening Saturday, September 7th. You can go to divisionmidway.org slash festival for more information. We're proud to support these partners throughout the year and we'll be there to um, table and talk a little bit about the work we're doing, so stop by and say hello. And finally, I'm very pleased to introduce a new staff member who will be completing the Governance, Learning, and Outcomes team. Faith Aiken was born and raised in the Tacoma, Washington area and has lived from India to Ireland before finding her way back to the Northwest. Faith has over six years of professional experience working on data collection and analysis analysis used to monitor process improvements, compliance, and outcomes. Most recently, Faith was an implementation specialist at Bethesda Lutheran Communities, playing a key role on the data quality management team for a national health care service provider. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in public policy from Portland State University. In her role at Prosper Portland, Faith is gonna help us tell clearer, better stories using data. She'll be a critical partner to refine our agency-wide metrics and human-focused outcomes, lead the ongoing reporting of agency accomplishments, and develop a system for monitoring and compliance obligations. So we are just delighted to have Faith. She's already hit the ground running, and we just want to extend uh, our welcome. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And welcome, Faith. Glad to have you. Great. So, uh, I have one quick announcement, which I neglected to make earlier, which I should go ahead and do. You've probably noticed that we're missing two commissioners today. So, as we only have three commissioners in, in attendance, per the City of Portland Charter, any unanimous vote with fewer than four commissioners will not take effect for 30 days from today. That said, we expect Commissioner Gambetti to call in for item number 13 so that that action can take effect immediately. All right, so next up we have meeting minutes. That's item number four. And uh, these are the meeting minutes for July 10. Would someone like to make a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. They're approved. Do we have any public comment? Nope. OK. All right, so now we have two items on the consent agenda, item number six approving an intergovernmental agreement with Multnomah County Library District for improvements to the Multnomah County Central Library. And then item seven, authorizing the executive director to submit an industrial site readiness program application for the ODOT blocks project in the Central Eastside Tax Increment Financing District. Would anyone like to 
have any comments about that or uh, we'll just go ahead and vote. Okay, someone would like to make a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Consent items pass. All right. Next up, item number eight. Uh, we have an, another action item, adopting a five-year extension to the Old Town Chinatown Action Plan. Bernie Karaski, welcome. Okay, how's that, better? Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair Cruz, Commissioner Platt, Commissioner Myers, Executive Director Branham, and others. Um, if you recall, back in June, we came before you with a, a update on the five-year action plan. And I think back then it was about 100 degrees out, but much better today. So today uh, we're here for uh, your adoption of the updated action plan which in many ways is similar to the old action plan, but, but tries to refreshen some of the goals and objectives and accomplish uh, many of the things that still need to be accomplished. So, so this is a little outline of our, our presentation today and what, we're, what, what the run of show will be. So in terms of um, strategic alignment, we think this, this hits all the bases plus homes. I think I would call that a home run jobs, neighborhoods, prosperity, partnerships. So this, this really is, is, is directly in our wheelhouse in terms of strategic alignment. In terms of public participation, we've had a lot of conversations with the community association, whose chair, Helen Ying, is, is here again today to uh, support the, the actual adoption of a plan. In addition to that, we've had many focus groups. This was, these were more around the RFPs, but we use those sessions to get input around this too and to just talk about general uh, goals for the community and we heard a lot. They didn't just focus on what they wanted to see at these two different sites that, that the Chair Branham mentioned, but really kind of like goals for the entire neighborhood. So it was, it, we were able to, to piggyback off of that. So history and context, again, this goes back to 2014. Uh, a lot of stakeholders did, did an analysis of you know, what, what were some of the problems in the neighborhood you know, imbalance of uses and identity, imbalance of uses, a lot of social services, which of course are needed, but those have, weren't balanced out by a lot of neighborhood serving businesses and other uses. Uh, perceptions of crime and, and safety, and then stagnant development, but we're starting to, to break that log jam now. We had a lot of good development in the last five years, but we're gonna be hopefully seeing a lot more to come. So uh, truly good development is on the horizon, we feel. And the old action plan, again, around neighborhood investment, business vitality, district livability. You know, I, I think of it as just property, business, and, and vitality, you know, to simplify it. And some of the subcategories are really still the same. Some have dropped off because they've been accomplished or the community wants to focus elsewhere, and we'll get into that a little bit, a little bit more later. So really, it, it's, 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 a, it's kind of an, a refinement and a continuation of, of what, what's been done in the past five years. So the focus area, it hasn't changed, okay? So we're, uh, the, the general boundaries on, on the west side are by the park blocks, uh, Burnside, mostly on the south, and then it jogs down the southwest oak and then the Broadway Bridge. I mean, basically, the, the, this, this focus area encompasses two different uh, uh, historic districts, the Skidmore, and then also new Chinatown, Japantown historic district, which if you look at the, uh, they're not the best, they're a little faint, the brown lines outline those two historic districts. And then it also encompasses two different urban renewal areas. We have the, both the River District and Downtown Waterfront in, in this action plan focus area. So the focus area hasn't changed, but the, but the community association really you know, emphasized that they would like us to focus more 
not all, but most of the resources uh, north of Bur Burnside and east of Broadway, where uh, the core of the neighborhood is. Yeah. So, so just a quick review on what was accomplished in, between 2014 and 2019. Uh, 260 moderate income housing units. That was a little bit below the goal of 500, but there was still good progress made in three projects. Nine ma major building re uh, renovations plus, most notably the Hoxton, um, the Grove Hotel renovation, and, and new construction of the, of the second part of that building. The Society Hotel, PNCA, uh, the, the, uh, the um, let's see, what else? The, expansion of, um, excuse me, uh, the Multnomah County Health Department, PNC College, and yes, this is the one that was looking at the Customs House to an a uh, co-working space. And in terms of retail stores and businesses, so Mimir Mole, Charlie's Deli, Deadstock Coffee, Pine Street Market, Bridgetown Barber Society, we see Starbucks has come down here and invested in the neighborhood, that, that's a good sign. Uh, produce Organic Streetwear. Uh, we're hoping that the gentleman who, uh, the entrepreneur who runs that business is gonna be here today. Uh, Laundry PDX, an expansion of ground control. And then professional services of Pensole Academy expansion, Airbnb, Anchor Moisson Architects into uh, 38 Davis, Moveville Software Design, and also University of Oregon expansion. And in terms of community livability, we've invested over $1.3 million in supporting mostly cultural institutions here, including the Lansu Chinese Gardens, the uh, Chinese uh, History Museum. And we've helped, uh, we've put lampposts uh, and just mundane things like garbage cans that help a lot to improve the livability here. So this is a, a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, kind of, of where we're at now and going forward that, that kind of helped us frame you know, this action plan. So. You know, we see all, there, there are some weaknesses and threats, but we think that the strengths and opportunities really, really outweigh, you know, the, the weaknesses and the threats. There's been good job growth. We have strong cultural institutions. What we're really excited about is see a lot of young entrepreneurs, especially young entrepreneurs of color, coming down here and investing and taking risks. Uh, demographic and income changes. There's population is growing down here and income is growing. It still lags the city by a lot, but there's been a lot of improvement in that. Strong community organizations and then availability of resources. So originally, uh, Prosper Portland and others committed over 57 million in both river, combined river district and downtown waterfront TIF resources. And the majority of those is, is still unspent and, and can be deployed for, for many of these great projects. Uh, there's some retail vacancies, that's bad, but it can also be good because we can, we can retenant these buildings and, and get some, get some uh, new businesses down here. And then we have uh, public sites and private sites for development. The, the, the public sites, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Kimberly alluded to that, was uh, block, um, excuse me, block 25, which is just to the north and the east of us. It has the Blanche House between um, Flanders and Gleason and third and fourth. And then also we have some private sites, which is right next to it. Uh, block 24, Lansu Chinese Gardens is in, has a purchase and sale agreement um, to purchase that property. And uh, I'll talk more about that too. And then we also have to the south of us, block 33, this whole parking lot is also potentially could be redeveloped. So a lot of opportunity. So the investments, so as, as I mentioned, that 57 million was, uh, was, is the total, but only four of that was spent between, that, that's the TIF resources between 18, uh, excuse me, the first, in the first uh, four years between 2014 and, and, and uh, fiscal year 18, 19. Uh, the city general fund, 60,000 was spent mostly to support uh, the community association and, uh, and the district manager to help. That's and 60,000. Uh, and then th that was met by 60,000 in funds from the community association. And going forward, uh, they're gonna raise all of those funds for the next, after this fiscal year. We had an SDC waiver, uh, of which that, uh, it could have gone up to five million, we used 725,000. Thus, we think that uh, we, we can cover the affordable housing with the inclusionary zoning. So no, we're not asking for a, um, uh, an ordinance to cover that. So all in all, there's, there's roughly, in TIF resources, we, could, we can deploy another 53 million. In, and the bulk of that is in downtown waterfront. It's about 35 million in downtown waterfront with the balance in, in the river district. 
So the updated action plan priorities. So we see, again, private redevelopment you know, to participate and encourage the private, the private redevelopment that we've mentioned, like on Block 24 and Block 23. Our redevelopment, 4th and Burnside, Block 25. Strategic infrastructure, one of the things that's happening down here is we're losing a lot of the parking. And you know it's controversial, but we're, 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 we're exploring ways to maybe replace at least some of that parking, not all of it, which could involve maybe partnering with Peabot uh, to find some, some ways to, to replace a lot of the, um, or it could also mean in these new developments that come up, we may find a way to help replace some of that parking. So it's, a, it's an exploratory phase right now. And then business vitality, especially neighborhood serving businesses, we keep hearing again and again from the, the community that we, you know, we don't want to have to leave to leave the neighborhood to get all our, our goods and services. You know, we want to be able to, 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 to shop local if we can. And then we want to foster entrepreneurship, especially with entrepreneurs of color that are coming down here and revitalizing the neighborhood and taking risk. And so that's a, that's a, that's a big, big um, priority. And it can keep with the cluster industry support and then honor the, the, the cultural heritage here. And one of those will be the next item on the agenda when we talk about uh, the potential sale of the Old Town Lofts condominium uh, to the Nikkei uh, Legacy Association. So we're excited about that. So um, update on Firth, Fourth and Burnside property. So as, as Kimberly mentioned, um, and she let me make the announcement, it was okay. <laughs> so we uh, just awarded the RFP, uh, we're proud to announce to the Colas Development Group. And you're all familiar with Colas Construction. This is the de their development arm of the, of the company. And uh, they are proposing to build a five to seven story structure, not only on that site, but they're partnering, what's exciting is with the adjacent, it's called Bing Kong Tong, a Chinese Benevolent Association. So we'll have not quite a half a block development, about two thirds of a, a well, two thirds of a half, whatever the math of that works out to be, five, six, or I'm not sure. But anyway, so it'll be a much larger development, more viable, because as you know, that, that site, that fourth and burn site, the former right to dream too, is really constrained. But, but with the addition of the Tong to the, to the north and that building, we think we can see something really exciting there. So they're envisioning ground floor retail with cultural space above that where the, the Tong would take that, that second floor and then also Colas would, would move a lot of their offices into that building. They're, they're down the street here, um, not far renting, but this would be, you know, of course, ownership space. So it's a, it signals a, a great commitment to, 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 the, uh, to the community. So all, they're, all, they're partnering with uh, Sarah Architects uh, and Resolve Architects and HDC, or the Housing Development Corporation, as you might re recall, uh, helped do the Asian Health Center. So they're involved in that. So this, is, this, this will be really exciting. And then yes, of course, above the first two floors, it'll either be three to five levels of, of, of uh, mixed income housing. Now on Block 25, which is to the north and the east of us, that, that's been awarded to a key development. We're excited to say that too. Uh, key development uh, was part of the Burnside Bridge development. I believe it's the yard development on, on, the, on the east side, so that's a very large project. Yeah, they're proposing a fairly ambitious project uh, uh, for it's a, two different structures on this property. One of them would be 19 floors that would have, um, let's see, 466 housing units, and they would have uh, about four or five stories of cultural space and then ground floor retail. So. They've been, they've been awarded that. And, and again, as Kimberly mentioned, our advisory committee was pretty much unanimous in, in, in selecting them. They thought they were very, very responsive to especially the cultural aspects of, of the request for proposal and tried very hard to work those in, in, into, their, into their development. Will it be that big in the end? We don't know, but it, we, we think that this, even if it's half that size, I think it could be a major win for the neighborhood. And then now block 24, uh, Lisa James, the executive director of Lands, who could probably ask more specific questions about this, but just in general terms, um, to give you the, the brief outline, it's, um, they have a executed purchase and sale agreement with Northwest Natural on this property. To, their vision is to build a, a cultural center on the south half of the block, and the original vision was for a hotel on the north end of the block. Perhaps that can still happen. They're talking to hoteliers. 
but um, they've asked us for to explore a potential partnership with them to help to help make this de development come to fruition. And if you have more specific questions, uh, Lisa would be glad to, to answer that. And in terms of equity impact, well, again, we see support for entrepreneurs of color, business owners of color, and developers of color, because now we have Colas Development Group coming in here to help out too. So this is really a, 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 a new focus, I think, or not a new focus, but a more of an emphasis now. And then also support for these key cultural institutions that we, we have down here, Land Sioux, the History Museum, Nike again, which we'll talk about, and we don't want to forget about the, the educational institutions, University of Oregon, PNCA, the Art College, and, and of course, uh, Penn Soul Sneaker Academy is another, is, a, is, is another great institution. So with that, um, either I'll take questions, Chair Cruz, or if you wouldn't want the present uh, other guests. <clears throat> uh, why don't we go ahead and hear from our guests? We have we have uh, three, three, guests three guests and then an additional public speaker. So why don't the first three come up? Uh, that would be Ms. Ying, uh, Ms. James, and Mr. Carter. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so I'm welcome. Helen Ying. I chair the Old Town Community Association. I hope that you remember when I was here back in June. And I just want to echo a lot of what um, Bernie had presented to you already. Uh, so um, many of the uh, pieces of the plan itself, the, our board actually uh, did a lot of our own um, reflection, you know, in terms of where, um, you know, what happened for the first five years? Why do we need to have an extension for the next five years? And really, if, as we look back, um, there were many factors for some of the things that didn't come to fruition like it was anticipated back in 2014 when the plan was first created. But yet, what I do know, what we do know, is that the foundation is laid and um, is poised to make um, the three uh, in focus areas to come to reality. And mainly I want to just kind of share with you why am I saying that? Well, we, we see evidence of the community coming together. You know, tw in 2014, our community so association was quite young. You know, we were probably like two years old at the time. But, um, but since then, um, we, our board has matured in lots of ways. And if you, if you look at the makeup of our board today, it not only includes all of the um, institutions that Bernie had described in the slides, but we also have a strong uh, representation from the residents. And so um, it, is, it is a truly, um, it is a way of seeing how our board is helping to connect the dots in our uh, community. One of our board members, his name is Dan Lenzen, and he often has said, you know, he's been in this neighborhood for over 20 uh, some odd years. He says, I've never seen this board work so well like it is right now. So that is a testament of uh, the good work that this um, board is doing. And uh, also, I wanna point out that at our monthly community meeting, it is a great venue where we're connecting our community members. Just to let you know, at the last month uh, community meeting, we had um, Patricia, who is the director for the new health uh, department um, headquarters. She showed up and she promised that they will continue to have someone at the table representing uh, the health department uh, headquarters. So that that's something that they actually promised that they would do when we signed a good neighbor agreement with them. And that is what we're doing. We're, you know, we're reaching out to different entities in our neighborhood and sharing that they are connected to the work in the neighborhood to help the neighborhood to prosper. That's what we want this um, action plan to do. And finally, as you also uh, have heard about um, how the neighborhood, so, uh, the, the community association has invested funds, right, by raising the money to help with this plan. And we are committed to raise even more money <laughs> for the next five years to help with this plan. And we would want uh, Prosper Portland for you uh, commissioners to approve this plan to help um, actualize the vision that is set out in this plan. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm Lisa James. I'm the executive director of the Lansu Chinese Garden since the first of uh, 2016, about three and a half years. And I also serve on the board of the Old Town Community Association. So I wanted to speak in favor of the extension of the five-year action plan. I think that it has been very thoughtfully revised and revisited and that it represents our best efforts to get input from throughout the community. And as we've watched the recovery and the uh, building boom in Portland and the cranes all around, they really haven't made it down here yet to Old Town. And despite all of the wonderful things reported, we still face you know, multiple blocks of blight and vacant boarded up buildings that you know, really do need um, the continued attention and inspiration and support so that we can reach that level of revitalization. Um, I wanted to speak on just two very quick things, and then I would stay after. I know you usually have to run to your parking lot, but uh, <laughs> I, um, I, the, the need for parking, I think, is been, it'll continue to be discussed and debated and, and investigated, but re representing the largest um, visitor venue in the central city that attracts about 200,000 people per year. We're only closed three days per year. Um, I need, we need parking. We are a nonprofit partner of Portland Parks. We need to have accessibility, and I have demographic studies that show the preponderance of um, mature citizens who come from retirement homes or our school children, 3,500 last year, a new record. So we, we really do need accessibility, and we need to be able to accommodate. Um, I'd love to have a driverless car drop me off. But that's, that's not going to be a reality for a long time. And for a tourist destination that sees about 80% of my visitors in the summer are coming from over 100 mile radius, um, it's very important because they come in from the coast or wherever, they come in in a car. Um, so I wanted to speak to the fact that that is a legitimate need, especially from our point of view, but also with our other partners. And then, yes, indeed, in 2008, this board approved resolution 6637, which spoke to a very comprehensive stakeholder process for the redevelopment of the north end of Old Town. And I think what you're seeing today are the vestiges of that materializing. I'm really excited about your next agenda item as well in support of the Nikkei endowment. Um, and our goal to purchase block 24 and use the south side that would be continuous and adjacent to the garden um, and working with PBOT already to close that street to vehicles and include it in their new green loop um, would really make it attached and create a public plaza and then the cultural center that has long been envisioned and was called out multiple times in those previous plans, resolution 6637, up to the recent focus groups that were held on block 25 across the street with no knowledge that we already had this intention but we hadn't reached an agreement with Northwest Natural at that time. So I'll conclude by saying that I do look forward. Um, I do ask for your consideration that we will have a partnership, a continued partnership, because we always have been a partner um, with Prosper Portland. And the mayor um, has sent someone to my office yesterday, wants to also make sure that um, everyone's aware that they are going to be supporting this cultural center, and it's very important to them. Thank you. Uh, Jordan Carter, um, I just opened up Produce Portland on the corner of 4th and Davis. Uh, I don't know as much about the five-year plan yet because I am a new business. Um, from what I have seen in the last three years, though, I do see a transition, and that is one of the reasons why I decided to open up a business in this neighborhood. I work over at Compound Gallery. I've been there for the last three and a half, four years. So I've seen kind of the transition with Starbucks moving in, the homeless camp moving out, um, as well as the homeless in general thinning out. I believe there is potential in this neighborhood with all the other new businesses like laundry, um, dead stock, unspoken, index. And I believe the streetwear community will develop here. Um, so it will be exciting to see where we do go in the future, as well as I believe, I'm not 100% for sure, but I believe that parking lot will also be developed. I don't know exactly when or if that's an mm -hmm. actual thing, but I've heard rumors. Um, so I do see a lot of growth in this neighborhood, a lot of potential. So far, moving in, it's been amazing. Um, 
I didn't expect sales to be what they were, and they beat all my expectations. Um, I kind of planned for worst case scenario because I am next to the methadone clinic, and even the security guards, they're handling things better, and they're actually paying more attention and moving out people by the time our store opens. Uh, so I do see a lot of community support as well as Prosper Portland. They, um, they gave me the, I believe, the Prosperity Investment Program grant, and so that has helped with the build-out situation as well as allowing me to fund and um, actually have a payroll for my staff starting out. So that helped a lot. Um, I'm very happy to see where things are going and excited just to see where we end up in the next five years. Great, thank you very much. Those are all great perspectives and it's exciting to see this come along. Really, um, do, you, do you want to make a comment? We actually, we have one more speak, public speaker, so oh, why, don't okay. we, why don't we address comments with these folks and then we'll go to the next speaker. Do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, yeah, thank you for your presentations and, and for the insight. Um, uh, Chinatown's actually my far favorite part of town, both because of the history and also because of the potential there. Um, and I'm curious, um, given its sort of, its thoroughfare kind of, it's a, it's a connector between, you know, much of the, the Central Park blocks, north part of the Pearl, and then of course the core of downtown and Old Town. Um, and I'm curious, to what degree the Broadway Corridor Project, which is of course a massive project and will be occurring within this next five year plus timeline, um, how much that is factored into your thinking about what impact it's gonna have on your area, right? And your plans and how, that, how that's gonna factor into retail, how you guys are thinking about the development of, of a sort of a, a, an identity for that district uh, that draws from its history. Um, from its unique architecture, all of those different things. I'm just kind of curious to see what that vision looks like in your minds. Well, so definitely we have been paying close, close attention mm -hmm. you know, to the, uh, the Broadway Corridor plan, and um, we want to be a part of the energy, right? We want to, um, how, how should I put it, uh, have a confluence of energy going, the development that's going on in our neighborhood as well as what's going on in the Broadway corridor. And um, to ensure, you know, there's like this seamless uh, um, uh, exchange of um, people moving from one neighborhood to another, right? And so um, one thing that we definitely have wanted to make sure that this this commission uh, is aware that we want to make sure, you know, the funds dedicated for this neighborhood will be uh, spent in this neighborhood. Um, because we, at, as you know, I think uh, many of you, uh, many of us have come before you to talk about how um, there are so many, um, you know, earlier when uh, Bernie presented the, the, the uh, analysis of um, the SWOT analysis, you know, there's so many challenges, right, that we need to overcome. And so hence why we have this five-year action plan to help um, ensure that we can overcome the challenges and barriers. And, and so we need to have the, the focus attention um, that, you know, that is uh, required to make this action plan become real at the same time to ensure what is planned for Broadway Corridor, um, you know, continues to uh, enhance the, the city like it's intended to. I would just add that, you know, Old Town, is, is in, imbalanced right now. And we are very excited about the Broadway Corridor Project because all of it will help create new vibrancy throughout this district and um, where there's kind of just blight of parking lots or dead space. And so it's such an amazing and significant long-term opportunity to, you know, be, and you're doing it thoughtfully and carefully. And that's what we're trying to be a part of as well. And so we, we attend all your meetings and because it is all interconnected in that synergy, but we need more moderate housing, workforce mid, you know, market rate, um, subject to the IZ. However, you know, right now our neighborhood is four of five homes are subsidized or restricted. We have the highest rate of personal crime. We need to get out of the imbalance, and the only way we're really going to do that are by adding the other things to bring it into balance. And um, so now is really the time where we have that opportunity to move forward in that way. Um, I believe coming from the ground floor, because again, I'm not as knowledgeable yet, 
Um, most of the other local business owners around here that I speak with, their vision for the future of Old Town is that this will become somewhat of a Pearl District, but not the same pricing as that. So everyone that I know of around here is excited to actually stay here and no one wants to leave. So I believe the developments that are going on, again, I'm not 100% sure, but the talk amongst the ground floor is that this will become somewhat of a Pearl District and this will become a destination when people visit Portland. And when they come to Portland, they'll make it a priority to stop into Old Town because this will be a staple. So. It is a destination. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Sure Myers? No? Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for your comments. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and your hard work. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. We have one more um, person in this segment. Uh, Ruth Ann Barrett. somebody left notes. Hi. Well, I have to breathe here first for a minute. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for the opportunity uh, to speak and uh, also want to thank people that, um, at Prosper Portland who have been with the neighborhood uh, for some time. Um, Bernie, who's presently uh, working hard and uh, Ms. Harpole before that, Sarah. I am a, uh, and I have to have notes. Lately, it's, things haven't been sticking. Um, I want to, um, well, first of all, I'm a renter. I live here, right over there. It's stone's throw. Uh, I've spent about $60,000 in this neighborhood, so I'm a consumer. I know we don't usually think of renters as consumers, but there you go. I'm a serial entrepreneur, and I don't usually like to use the word serial because it's so closely associated with killer, but there you go. I'm on my third one. I'm a community activist, pain in the neck that I am, and I'm a sustainability advocate and have been for 10 years or more. And I'm also one of those people that you talk about that's in the technical media space. Um, I run a search engine. And I concentrate on voices of sustainability. So if you want to know who they are, you can come to earthsayers.tv. I'm really coming to talk to you today about being, from a marketing perspective, and as a citizen activist about something that I consider to be missing. Um, I support funding the plan. I'd be nuts uh, not to. And I think you'd be nuts not to fund it, and I'll say that to the council. Um, but there's something missing, and what's missing is diversity and inclusion in your processes to get people involved in their neighborhood. Um, and that's specifically addressed on page four under community participation uh, and feedback. And I have a suggestion that as commissioners and as leaders uh, and as executive director that you start asking for and getting numbers. For example, it says that, and mainly thanks to Bernie, uh, that you reached out and had 140 uh, people involved. And so I have to ask, 140 what? Residents? Mm, no, I don't think so. And renters, I know you don't. Uh, it's gotten better because in the last couple of years because I've been a real pain in the neck about it. And it's not just renters in affordable housing, I'm low income, put that life, I, I should wear that label across my chest. Um, but it's also the people 
who are in support of housing, um, much of it run by Central City Concern. And um, there's no good representation in the committees, in the groups, in the task forces, in the associations. And um, it's unfortunate, I think. My neighbors come in all colors. And I'll just talk about my one building. We've got women. We've got men. We have people of color. We have pole dancers. We have interior designers. We have data scientists. We have retail workers, low-wage workers. And we have disabled persons, both mentally and physical. And um, this is an, an enormously important group of people. Thank you, Thank Ms. Barrett. You. We appreciate your comments, and uh, we will uh, consider them as we try to do more outreach here. So, thank you. So, get me the numbers. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Any questions? No, right? Actually, Bernie is going to come back, and uh, to, to the extent we have more questions, we need to have some follow-up from Bernie if we want to, and then vote. So, thank you. We have more questions or comments? No? Okay. Um, I guess I'll just pose the same question to you about the Broadway corridor um, and how that's factoring in internally, just for, for our uh, knowledge, how that's factoring into the planning around coordination between that huge project, this new action plan, and then thinking about the impacts of a, you know, a massive development as a catalyst for additional work and additional sort of activity within within Old Town Chinatown? Well, we, we've had some coordination on the outreach when, when we were doing, which I think was really an extensive outreach for this project. It's not perfect. I mean, we can always reach more people, but we, we had multiple open houses and, and events. At, and it, we had some on the east side um, at, the, at the Asian Health Center. We, we focused on multiple different communities. But, you know, Ruthann has a point. We can always do a little bit better. Um, we, we also included, we, we asked questions about the Broadway quarter on that and to try to see how, what people thought. And, and, and most people were pretty excited that that, that energy could spill over and, and, and help the, this area too. And, and they both, both districts can help each other out, you know, especially in that transition zone right now in the north, northwest of this, is, which is it, it were really a lot of vacant space and a lot of open. And with the Broadway quarter coming in there, they're kind of bridge that gap and and, and we'll see you know, more, more business and, and people flowing in both directions. So. I'm also curious because there's such a historic character to this, to this old town, Chinatown, right? It is sort of really much the heart of old Portland. And then with a brand new development coming in the Broadway, it's all new construction, right? State of the art, all that. Um, I'm kind of curious about the thinking in terms of the juxtaposition of those two and then figuring out how it is that, again, the two can play off of one another, right? There's sort of a symbiosis. Yes, can, yes. So I'm curious again at the at the at the committee level, at the planning level, how this has been factored into thinking about again the character of the space, how it how it brands itself. Um, we just heard from uh, I don't know where he is, but uh, earlier about yes about the the fact that you know there's already talk at the retail level about this being a new destination for retail, right? Um, much like the Pearl has become in its own way. Um, but but more affordable, right? So I'm, yes, I'm yeah, I think curious. that's the key. Yeah, I think I'm just I, I'm just wanting to sort of track the thinking about what it is that at the various levels of participation, whether it's on the ground, at the planning level, uh, citizen activists, etc., how folks are thinking about the evolution and what this what this community will look like, right? Five years hence, ten years, fifteen, right? I'm, I'm, it just I like to I like to think. Oh no, it's that it's way. yeah, it's fascinating. Well, I think it, it's a testament to to what's going to happen. That key development came in and 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 their proposal for a lot of housing and, and and betting on that in the north end of the block, which right now is pretty vacant. And so you know they had a, a very strong vision for 
for, for neighborhood retail there that I, I think the Broadway quarter and that energy informed it would provide market share for that too, not just not just here. So it would serve serve the residents here, but we, it would also be supported. I mean, businesses have to draw right from a larger trade area, not just locally, that that would, that would help too. Could I maybe add to that? Um, so there are, there is some portion of the Broadway corridor that is actually within Old Town Chinatown. And so when ZGF and our team has been doing an analysis from a design perspective and from a vision perspective, it includes the it includes Union Station, it includes Block R, which is right next to Multnomah County. And so while it wasn't a um, development vision for the entire Broadway corridor and Old Town Chinatown, there was some consideration put into what does it look like for us to activate Union Station and Greyhound and Block R, and how do we respect the history of the place and, may, and make it this bridge? I think as we go from the master plan requirements for the post office specifically, that we'll get into a bit more detail about what that might look like. Um, and so I think we have wanted both for the Broadway corridor and for our work in Old Town Chinatown to really embody the values of respecting, honoring, and celebrating the history of the place and in particular, the Chinese American, Japanese American, and indigenous and African American histories of the place. Um, and then to create this inclusive, mixed use, multi dimensional um, space. The work that the Stakeholder Advisory Committee did to articulate what that means for Old Town Chinatown, um, I think, resulted in just fabulous visions that really include each of those elements. And so as we have more conversations with our development partners, we're excited to bring those visions back. And, and I do think that there's a way that they can be very complementary to what is envisioned from a density and use perspective at Broadway Corridor. And then in terms of the actual design, again, keeping as much of the historic feel to it, I feel that's... Yes, and it's all within, I mean, this is, this is where it's all within a historic sort of, district, yeah. so it's mm -hmm. all for review Got by it. Design Commission within very strict standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Thanks, Kimberly. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. All right. Well, this is very exciting. You know, things lagged there for a little while, but we've, we're back with a vengeance here, and uh, it seems really great to see things happening like this. So. So thanks to everybody for your hard work, and thank you, Bernie. Thank you. So, so why don't we go ahead and uh, vote on our motion then. This is re resolution number 7331. Oh, excuse me. Resolution number 7330, adopting the five-year extension to the Old Town Chinatown Action Plan. Would somebody like to make a motion? To I move that we adopt the five-year extension of the Old Town Chinatown Action Plan. Thank you. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. OK. Passes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great. Well, I'm going to sit here because I, <laughs> I have a double header. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take a breath. Take a breath. And okay, now we'll do uh, <laughs> item nine, which is authorizing the sale of the Prosper Portland owned Old Town Lofts commercial condominium at 411 Northwest Flanders Street, Unit 100, to the Oregon Nikkei Endowment for $1 million. Resolution number 7331 this time. Okay, great. Thank, thank you, Chair Kurz. So again, this is um, condo uh, 411 Northwest Flanders, Unit 100. You can see the, the, the picture of the building there in the Old Town Condominiums um, building. And this is on the southwest corner of that building, a, a 4,100 square foot condominium there, what you can see in the corner. Uh, it was previously occupied by Enthusiasm Collective, and then before that, the Oregon Storyboard. We were leasing that space space to them. And so this, this has its origins really in Nikkei wanting to find a permanent home down here, you know, the Nikkei endowment. And, it, and this is just fortuitous because this, this section, you know, that, that I've been educated, you know, on this project that was really kind of a center of, of, of Japantown. There was a lot of businesses and, 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 and cultural um, uh, institutions down here, and I'll show you a slide for for one of them. So we're 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 excited if they if this could this could go forward. Although it's not a historic building, it's it's in a historic it's in the it's in the uh, uh, New Chinatown Japantown historic district, and they would use this for their museum off and in, in, in offices space, and they're kind of they're on Second Avenue right now. Um, near Second and Davis, and so they're a little cramped in that space. It's a beautiful building, but they don't own the space, so this helps them control their destiny. 
and we think this hits neighborhoods, healthy neighborhoods, and especially partnerships with our cultural institutions. And that gives you a little bit better picture of, of, of where this is located with, uh, with respect to uh, us in the neighborhood here. And you can see how close it is to block uh, 25, um, literally right across the street that we just, we just talked about in the last presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, history, um, we acquired this ground floor condominium space in 2010, along with 15 parking spaces. It was um, acquired in lieu of a condemnation. We gave uh, two different loans on this building, uh, totaling about uh, for the construction of the, the, this largely affordable housing building or mixed mixed income housing building for about $4.8 million. And there was about $1.8 million left on the note. And this is in 2010 where there were some financial difficulties. So then rather going through the, the condemnation process, uh, we, we took over control of this space and, and, and 15 of, of, the, of the parking space. Okay, so public outreach on this. Um, we've talked about this at numerous uh, boards at the, um, the community association is in support of this. And also that we're, we're happy to, to announce that the condominium association at the Old Town Lofts is, is very excited about this. As it turns out, I believe there's actually one person on their board whose mother was in actually in one of the internment camps, and so there's a lot of history there. So there, there's a, a lot of support for this. And you can see on some of the slides, these are some of the exhibits uh, that they have will be transported over to this. <clears throat> Equity impact, again, the, the endowment really has been promoting Jap Jap Japanese American culture here since 2002. And, and this, this acquisition just really empowers them to, to be able to control their own destiny here and continue the, the, the good work that they do um, uh, teaching us about Japanese history and keeping that history alive into the future. And so in terms of transactions terms, this we're proposing a sale for a land sale contract. So we'll, so we'll hold the deed until, until that contract is paid off for $1 million, which is based on a, a broker's opinion of value in July of 2018. So we're, uh, it would be a 20-year amortization at 2.5%, and we would want to close that sale on November, excuse me, December 1st to, um, by the latest. And this is in the downtown waterfront urban renewal project, so those, those, those funds would accrue to, to, that, to that budget. And uh, if you have questions, but before that, this is uh, the Japanese American School. I think uh, we'll have to see, or maybe Lynn can help me out on this, Lynn Fuchigami. Um, I think this is circa 1930s. And this is um, at Northwest Fifth and Flanders. This is on the back end of that block. So if you walk down where Ascendant Brewing is, this is right next door to that. So this, was, this used to be the, the Japanese American School. So, okay. Great. So with that, I'll open that. I'll give it back to you, Chair Cruz. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, why don't we go ahead and have our uh, public testimony. We have two uh, representatives from the Oregon Nikkei Endowment here, uh, Brian Kimura and Lynn Futigama. If you'd like to go ahead and join us, great. Thanks for coming today. Oh. Thank you for providing this opportunity. Um, my name is Lynn Fujigami Parks, and I'm the executive director for Oregon Nikkei Endowment. And I've been in this neighborhood for probably, in some way, shape, or form, for about 40 years. Um, and um, first of all, I just wanted to express our deep appreciation um, for this for providing this opportunity uh, for our organization to um, secure a permanent home in this neighborhood. Um, this is something that has been a dream for our community for quite some time. Um, and we can't underscore um, the importance of this as um, this was a very large and vibrant Japan town at one time. And um, our museum and the Japanese American Historical Plaza along the waterfront are really the only vestiges of what is left of, of that community in that Japantown. 
So for the past several years, we have, we have been on the hunt to try and find property to acquire. And as I probably don't have to explain, um, it's been very difficult for a small nonprofit to compete with commercial developers and investors. So um, it's been very challenging. Um, and of course, enter Prosper Portland, and this is what brings us here today. So um, your letter of intent to sell to us has really provided um, wonderful opportunities to get this project off the ground um, in one one way we were, um, the letter of intent enabled us to, to uh, be considered for the Cultural Advocacy Coalition slate of projects to be um, advocated for in the legislature. Um, and we were ultimately chosen to be one of six projects and that bill recently passed, so we'll be receiving a half million dollars for um, capital construction for cultural projects. Um, and in addition, uh, we've been truly blessed to uh, secure two lead donors, and that's been a combination of uh, years of establishing relationships, uh, our reputation, fortuitous timing, and hard work and trust, and a lot of faith. Um, we believe that we had the capacity to raise the funds needed for this project, um, but we could not have really foreseen or imagined um, two lead donors stepping up and really being so generous to make this happen. So we're moving forward with our exhibit designers, which is Aldrich and Pears, and the fabricators, uh, Pacific uh, Studios, to design a new core exhibit in this space. It will be vibrant, immersive, interactive, and most of all, um, it will really be one that we hope will inspire visitors to consider um, and the value of di the diversity of our, our country and um, the multicultural society that our country is made up of. Um, this is not just sharing this history, but it's hoping to ensure the future. And it's not, um, it is an immigrant story, but it's an American story. So we believe that the center, this new center in our museum will really be a catalyst for the north end of this district. And um, we are very committed to really support um, and collaborate to ensure the success of the projects on Block 25 as well as Lansu Gardens Vision for their project um, as well. So again, we just want to express our deep gratitude for this opportunity and we really hope that you'll be as confident and excited about this project as our, our lead donors have been. So thank you. I just wanted to add, uh, well, first of all, thank you for uh, having us up here and uh, listening to our. Um, but one thing, uh, when we first uh, set out on the exploration for a new home, uh, we were renting uh, at the Merchant Hotel. and. Um, it was through a very uh, generous donation of the original founder that gave us a, a, a zero cost lease on the space for 20 years and uh, that ultimately comes to an end at the end of this month. Um, and when we began our search five years ago, we asked both the community and the uh, board and, and all the members, um, where is the ideal place? And it was unanimous that our future home needs to be in Old Town. This is where the community started, and this is where the community needs to still maintain its presence. Um, our organization also uh, manages the Japanese American Historical Plaza down on, on the waterfront. And so it's also equally important to create that bridge between the center and the Memorial Plaza. And so, uh, our programming provides tours, education, um, outreach to schools, and linking the two, the Waterfront Memorial Plaza with the museum uh, really connects the dots and creates the whole story for uh, the Japanese American history of Oregon. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, comments? It's exciting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Questions or comments?
comments for Bernie? Chair, may I just make one comment? Um, I was remiss in not noting earlier that when we looked at the impact of Broadway Corridor, because as you know, we did a racial equity and impact assessment to look at what the potential ramifications were, particularly looking at gentrification and displacement considerations. And because there are so many people who have long-term affordability, or so many buildings that have long-term affordability, we did not find that there was a lot of risk for gentrification or residential displacement. What we did, however, recognize was that for the cultural institutions that were renting, that there would be potentially a risk. And so um, we did feel like it was particularly important to shore up and support businesses, I'm sorry, institutions that have long been in this area like Nikkei to make sure that as the market around them expands that they are able to participate and stay. That, was that also true of, of the commercial tenants as well? Yes, we've been looking at, at that as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any further comments or questions for Bernie? Okay. All right, then. Would someone like to make a motion to approve uh, resolution number 7331? I will so move the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you. Second. All right, thanks. All those in favor? Aye. All right. All right. Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your great work. Okay, so next we have action item uh, number 10, adopting changes to the Prosper Portland social equity policy. And Maya and Court, welcome. Welcome back. Good afternoon. Um, Direct, Executive Director Branham, Chair Cruz, and Commissioners. My name is Mayra Reola, and I'm the Director of Equity Governance and Communications at Prosper Portland. And I have with me two amazing people that I'm gonna um, have given the opportunity to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm, uh, my name is Rana Ujaman. I'm the Program Director at Portland Youth Builders, a pre-apprenticeship program in Southeast Portland by the Lynch neighborhood. Hey everyone, um, I'm Court Morris. I'm the Equity and Inclusion Program Manager here at Prosper. And uh, Rana also serves as the Council on Economic and Racial Equity co-chair, and is, uh, our other co-chair is out of town, Cole Reed. She could not be here, but um, Cole, uh, we'll, Rana will be talking more about Siri in a, in a little bit. Um, so the objectives of the so this presentation are primarily three. Uh, we want to provide a high-level update on particularly the last couple years of um, equity efforts that have been implemented at Prosper Portland. I want to also use this opportunity to introduce our agency-wide equity framework and to also highlight the work that CORE has been doing around developing equity strategies and priorities. And lastly, to bring forward proposed amendments to our existing social equity policy in the context of the uh, newly released equity framework. This effort is in alignment on, with all of the goals within our strategic plan, is in providing uh, kind of the equity lens or equity frame when implementing our strategic plan around jobs, neighborhoods, prosperity, and partnerships. So as I mentioned earlier, um, this uh, update is primarily focusing in the last couple of years. So around that point in time, we received three pieces of very critical feedback from um, our staff. One was uh, through our human resource department, the cultural survey that we do every other year. The second was uh, uni uh, feedback we received from our union about some uh, recommendations to improve our internal practices. And the third is the work that we had uh, been doing with um, our consultant at the time, Desiree williams Reggie from Capua Consulting, who really played a critical role in helping us uh, move forward and propel in the direction of the creation of the equity framework. So I just wanna acknowledge her role as well. What we heard from that feedback is that primarily there were uh, two things within the effort around uh, racial equity is that we, uh, things that were working really well. So one of the things was that we had strong policies and practices and that our strategic plan really positioned us to advance racial equity objectives within the context of our work. And that we also had opportunities to really deliver a lot of innovative programming, particularly within economic development. Some of the things that you see now are smart people's markets, 
the market, the Inclusive Business Research Network, um, a lot of different efforts that we have um, move forward as an organization. And at the same time, we, there were two key areas that needed really focused attention. One is the need to focus on internal culture change and how we were supporting each other and supporting our staff in advancing our strategic plan. And that um, be, we also needed to provide a lot of clarity internally on, and alignment on how equity efforts were being developed. So we were, it's not like we were not doing it, we were doing it, but we were missing a cohesive uh, and very clear way and path for staff to follow or to um, relate to when they were implementing those practices. So um, the first area um, in the context also for um, existing equity policy, some of the things that uh, we started focusing on given the feedback we received was uh, primarily in reinforcing our commitment to culture change. So the two main ways in which we did this uh, from an HR perspective, human resource perspective, uh, we, uh, once we created our cultural agreements, which we introduced or were developed in co-creation with staff through trainings that we had, we offered internally, we, th these cultural agreements were really um, used as a resource to redesign some of our um, approaches to staff retention, to um, look at the way in which we were doing onboarding with new staff, putting together or creating plans for having mentors and pals so people had resources, human resources to, uh, to lean into. Um, we also um, really used the, the uh, human resources, utilize those um, cultural agreements to incorporate them into the collective bargaining agreement with the union, which was, uh, from my perspective, a really critical milestone in how we approach that process in the future. Um, we also, from an implementation standpoint, we created uh, our, uh, an equity and inclusion program management position, which is now filled by Court Morris. We also revised our equity plan, which are now we're calling our equity studies and priorities, which Court will be um, talking about in a little bit, showcasing the process they underwent. We, uh, also, as a result of Court's work, uh, we now launched uh, e uh, Learning Labs and the Equity Collective to increase the resources available and, and support for staff. And we are uh, we finalized the creation of the Equity Framework, which I will be introducing you to you in a little bit. I also, when, as I mentioned earlier, I really want to acknowledge the role that human resources play in advancing some of these initiatives, particularly Sean Murray, our ex uh, HR director. And I also want to acknowledge the role that our Equity Council has played in activating some of the cultural agreements and, and really helping propel some of the internal culture change work. Uh, the next thing I want to highlight is our programs, our invest, our, our programs and investments. Um, less than six months ago, approximately six months ago, we released the 2020 Strategic Plan's three-year status report. So as you know and are familiar with by now, um, that's where we really um, Basically, objective and goal by goal, we contrasted how we were doing against our strategic plan. So all that information is available in our website, and you've seen it and received it at the beginning of the year. But some of the highlights that I also want to um, showcase within that effort are around uh, things that we were making progress on, uh, particularly on inclusive entrepreneurship, on our non-tax increment finance resource development, and our, in our asset management approach. And uh, some things that needed a lot of attention also moving forward, which um, are primarily in supporting developers of, of color. And again, culture change, inclusive environment, and how we approach our work. And um, some things that we, are, that we heard that needed support and we are actually activated is one, the culture change work, which is why we're updating you about here. The increased access to capital from um, on which also our Council on Economic and Racial Equity, Siri, has played a role in providing feedback and how to make it more inclusive and equitable. And um, in the policy to developing a policy to institutionalize public benefits, we also have a position now that will be helping moving, move, for, move that forward in, the, in this fiscal year and for which Siri will also be playing a role. Some additional things that were accomplished, uh, we revised our agency work plan and individual work plan, so now you can find an equity outcome there. So, so, so we all need to identify how we are uh, moving forward or making progress on those outcomes. And um, as you know, a lot of our programs and investments just keep delivering on equity goals through existing um, efforts. 
As part of our uh, program and investments um, approaches, we also really pay a lot of attention and uh, make a big priority to move business and workforce equity goals. So some of the things that you see reflected on this on this slide really highlight the you know the things and the improvements we've we've really noticed because of our ability and, and increased transparency in reporting data on a monthly basis on our website. Um, and you know that has allowed us to have to apply learnings on a on a more proactive way. Now we're hosting more debriefs, we're having proactive approaches to support developers and contractors in meeting goals. It has increased our understanding of what are the obstacles and challenges that you know uh, small businesses or um, workforce you know uh, efforts um, have. So um, on that on that work in particular, I really want to uh, use opportunity to highlight the role that John Cardenas, um, or senior construction business and workforce equity project manager, and Wendy Wilcox, construction specialist for all the efforts. They, those are the main two functions, paying attention to the information and the data we collect, and really focusing on supporting the implementation of um, business and workforce equity goals. Um, the, it, these highlight uh, showcases the, uh, the, the, the web page in which we showcase this data on a monthly basis. These are, you can find it on our website at www that prosper Portland that US and this is updated on a regular basis some you know things that I want to you know just mention that are is, is based on the most recent data we we received from a business equity standpoint um, Allen Temple TI is operating at 81 percent 81 percent of you know from uh, on business equity and in at the convention center is currently at 27 percent so they are operating above our existing goals and thresholds and from a workforce training and hiring standpoint, Woody Wood Guthrie um, is currently operating at 45% in minority participation out of 20% from a good faith effort. And Sideyard is currently at 11% of female participation of 15% uh, good faith effort that we have in our specifications. So that is just a, a way uh, of trying to showcase how we have really improved our ability to support the delivery of our business and workforce equity goals. From an accountability and collaboration standpoint, uh, we, in the last couple of years, launched the Council on Economic and Racial Equity. We created, we are in the process of revamping the what we know as a budget, uh, budget advisory committee. Uh, so we have a long-term year engagement with them, increasing their, uh, the opportunity for us to share um, how our budget process works and provide more clarity on our budgetary decisions. We also hired a community engagement program manager, which primarily works with our development and investment team in supporting um, in community engagement on efforts like Old Town Chinatown and others. Um, and we, who just, you just met earlier, uh, Faith Aiken, we created the reporting, reporting evaluation and learning position to really enhance her ability to talk about her story, her impact, and her outcomes. So now uh, Rana is going to provide some uh, background on Siri. First of all, I want to say thank you again for um, having me here to uh, tell you about the work that we're doing. Um, it took a while for Siri to come together and figure out what it is that we're going to be doing, figure out our focus. I mean, as groups come together, you know, you, I guess, form, norm, and storm, and I think we're in the norming phase and essentially what we are is an equity like uh, um, like audit committee. We are reviewing uh, policies program. We are working in parallel with Prosper Portland around initiatives and strategic planning and bringing multi-level of expertise of individuals in communities that uh, low economic communities of color that have been impacted by a multitude of things. It gives an opportunity for a voice. It gives an opportunity for authentic partnership, community building. And I think it's uh, a feather in Prosper Portland's cap to stick with this work and throughout our time acting with integrity, being as transparent as they can. Equity work is very difficult. My belief, equity done at its best is slow you want to do it with intentionality, you want to do it with care, and you will make mistakes along the way. It's how you learn from those mistakes, how you handle yourself when things get difficult, looking out for each other and knowing the greater good, 
and working together. And essentially, it's, we have a lot of work ahead of us. We're excited to do this work. We have definitely dedicated many, 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 many hours to do this. And it is a labor of love. And I can speak for Siri to say that, you know, we believe in this work. We believe in Prosper Portland's goals and their strategic planning and their equity vision. And we're just happy to be a part of it. And I just want to add a giant thank you to Rana. Um, we, we have an opportunity to meet weekly now, um, which builds uh, a really great foundation of trust. Um, we have an opportunity to flag things together um, in that group meeting with the co-chairs um, and have uh, staff have a chance to engage with the co-chairs before going to the full group. And so um, Rana has uh, basically a second job with us, and I just wanted to publicly um, thank you for, for all the hard work you've done, as well as Cole, who couldn't be here today. Um, in the same vein, I really want to recognize the, not only the wisdom, but the commitment and the, um, in some ways, stubbornness to make this work. Without it, we, we wouldn't be here. And so we just really appreciate their loyalty to the effort, um, bringing out doubts and questions when they, 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 will, they, they exist, and having really honest, hard conversations around what is needed to really fully activate our, an external advisory body with transparency and trust in a, in a very relational way around work that sometimes is transactional in nature. So it, there's a constant tension, but I do think that um, without their leadership displayed by our co-chairs, particularly here, Rana, today, um, we wouldn't be here. So just, we would just want to acknowledge and thank you for all your work. Um, with that, before I move into introducing the equity framework, are there any questions or comments for this part of the presentation? I'd be interested in hearing this a little more about Siri and how many members there are and how it's, how it's set up. How it's set up, yeah. Well, uh, currently there's approximately 15 members. Uh, there's two co-chairs, Cole and myself, and the members are from, bring various experiences from different aspects to like entrepreneurship, to um, deep knowledge in like, you know, workforce equity, deep knowledge in community benefits agreements, looking at um, absolutely equity work, dismantling racism, highlighting uh, uh, white supremacy systems, and how the wonderful thing is how it comes together in a way to move forward because um, like data, I mean, <laughs> Like data, equity work can be uh, interpreted in multiple different ways. You can take one point of view and focus on it for a long time or extrapolate it in ways that may be counterproductive to the work. Something that we've seen is we've more often than not seen alignment. And I want to speak to something that Myra said. It took time and trust that we can tell each other how we're feeling in a space that is safer I don't want to say safe space, it's a safer space to be real, to be like, how is this improving workforce equity? Where are our like, communities of color prospering and benefiting from the programs and policies that you have in place? It's a, it's a beautiful thing, and I think this is something, I hope that this is something that lasts for quite some time. Great, thank you. Sure. The follow-up question, uh, how, do you, how do you plan in the short term and the long term to measure progress? Um, it's something that I know it's been discussed at the uh, staff level for a while and, and is always a challenge when it comes to equity work. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear what, what your think, thoughts are at this time about how you, know, you think about it and how, as, as commissioners, we should be tracking that and, and, and looking to, to chart that progress along the way. I'm going to answer that the best that I can. <clears throat> I would say something that uh, I've learned to love is, is data. I've never been a fan of data because you get immersed in it and it's confusing. I find it confusing. And something that I do is I look, I want to see what was working, what hasn't been working, involving the community in conversations. Like this seems to be working on paper. Does it work in your neighborhood? Involving like um, um, outside perspectives, definitely. And using that data, not to predict the future, but to plan a better future. And I know that answer can seem simplistic, but something that I'm a big fan of is, more often than not, when we discuss things about equity, individuals make it more difficult than it needs to be. Some of it can be not as hard. I mean, equity work plays 
into your heart, into your soul, and how do you compartmentalize things and at times have the three intersect or have moments of intersectionality without it derailing the work. I mean, for me, that is how I would do it. I would look at how, what's working well, you know, what isn't working well, and are there things that we can learn from each other? You know, where, are there, where is there departmental collaboration? Was there involved in this product or policy that is working well? Like, what were the steps that were in place? And basically dig and ask questions and probe through, like, honest dialogue and not being afraid to say something that may not be the smartest or say something that may not, may, it may derail the conversation, but knowing that the way to find the answer is by making mistakes. If I could add also, um, I think Siri is a really great sounding board for us. So, you know, here's our intent, but is this the impact that you're going to see or what's your initial kind of gut check? Or um, they're saying, hey, you're, you're missing a huge hole here, or this is how the process could be more beneficial. Um, and we've also started a new um, process this year where Siri gives recommendations. We bring those back and discuss them. Um, and then we very, um, in a transparent way, loop back with Siri to say, of your series of recommendations, here's the ones we think that we can um, manage. So it's taken some time to build that process, um, but Siri will have direct reports of how we've taken their impact and how um, some of it is a yes, some of it's a no, and some of it has to be a maybe. Um, and so I'm really excited about that process too. I think, um, I mean, one of the challenges is serving in a commercial level where we have some kind of citizen oversight, but we're not privy to the internal uh, collaborations is we have to rely upon snapshots, right? And, and certain quantifiable data or examples, right, to, to base our judgment on. Um, and so the degree to which we can continue working out how it is that we're going to define what progress means, what it looks like, right, mm -hmm. how we measure it, um, that's important work um, because I think that'll also build uh, confidence mm -hmm. and, and credibility um, in such a way that uh, Prosper achieves its role not only of being an equity champion, uh, but in sharing those best practices with other organizations, right? Um, because I know that from the private sector, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of interest in demand, mm -hmm. but not a lot of knowledge, right? So I think that's part of the work that, that, that I see us doing uh, long term. But I would urge you to, as much as possible, I know it's a, it's a, it's a long and messy process, but as much as possible, try and package it into, into some, some kind of quantifiable, measurable unit, if, if at all possible. Thank you. Yeah. So, hey, thank you for the work that you've done, and thank you for being here today. Ron, it's good to see you again. Good to see you, too. <laughs> uh, business and workforce equity should always be tracked separately and should be separate policies, and I know we have a workforce mm -hmm. training and hiring policy and an MWSP uh, business policy as well. Um, the, the, I just want to keep reminding everybody of this. Every time this comes up, when I see them on the same page together, a lot of times what will end up happening is one will be at the expense of the other. Mm. And when we bulk it together, we usually go with the one that we have the most control over, and that's usually contracting, um, whether it's contractors or, or hiring a business for something. And, and we lose sight of, of the, the actual workforce, which is a much broader community, uh, much more in need of that equity policy. Um, you know, when, when we allow that to happen, we, we are at risk of playing favoritism over, one over the other, and it's one at the expense of the other. The majority of our diverse contractor and business base comes from a diverse workforce. So I uh, just want to make sure that everybody recognizes that and is aware of that. We need to focus on workforce as, as a separate policy and prioritize it. I mean, it's, something that is, is essential for this to work. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, thank you for your good work, and this looks great. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so next in the presentation is um, introducing our equity framework. So the purpose of the framework is to provide clarity, alignment, shared language, and increased access to resources, as well as ongoing learning, primarily for staff. The three primary ways we are intending this framework to be used is to keep supporting internal culture change efforts, to be used as a resource for communications, and to help inform internal organizational development work. So this is where our framework operates or where it sits. As we know, we have our strategic plan, which is our what. It's a five-year document. We're currently in year four. 
The equity framework is uh, the, a guiding document that really provides the how and, um, and kind of the ways and considerations that we all as staff need to have when implementing our strategic plan. Um, then after that, we have our annual high-level agency work plan, which is informed and co kind of in some symbiotic way co-created through individual work plans. So it's, they are mutually informed. And out of particularly those two documents, we have the work that court has been leading in the last year around the revamped equity action plan, or now what we call their equity priorities and strategies. So that document is a very clear guideline for us as an organization to understand and know how we can best support our staff in implementing our strategic plan in the context of the agency, the equity framework. And court will be providing some more details on how that process um, was developed. So the, the, the framework is basically a series of guiding documents. And so these uh, have you know, uh, an introduction letter from our executive director setting the context and expectations, um, uh, our agency's story and equity journey, right? So for anybody, no matter how long we've been here, particularly for new staff, so we all have a very comprehensive understanding of where we come from, why we are having certain impacts, and what are some things that we are really trying not to repeat. Um, some concepts, concepts and definitions, so we all have shared language. So when we say, you know, we're leading with equity, equity, this is what we mean. When we say, use a specific term, this is what we mean, right? So there's no uh, question or confusion. But we're also introducing the equity model for change and internal roles. This is the, the model we are using to really convey how everything that we're doing really is to help advance our strategic plan from an equity standpoint, which I will um, guide you in a second, guide you through it in a second. The cultural agreements that were um, co-created with staff through the learning sessions we had with the Center for Equity and Inclusion, meeting agreements, which are basically how we are uh, having shared accountability and expectation of each other and how we show up and behave in the workplace, guiding documents, um, all the documents that play a role in advancing our framework and just infrequently ask questions for staff to use as a guidance and resource. So um, our model for change. So as we know, our, st our strategic plan is ultimately the goal is to build an equitable economy, and we do it through focusing on neighborhoods, jobs, prosperity, and partnerships. And we, um, we know that it's not just about saying we want to do it. We also need to focus internally in, in, in having our staff experience what we want to see on the outside. So we, don't, we cannot focus on an equitable economy if internally our staff, and particularly staff of color, are having a disparate experience. They're not feeling included, seen, acknowledged. So how can we possibly convey the same outcome or expect the same outcome externally? So we have been really paying a lot of attention on how we're supporting each other, how we are listening to staff, and how we're use, utilizing the wisdom and existing you know, knowledge and skills in creating, like, working together as an organization to really create a shared culture, understanding that we all play a role in it, either in maintaining it or disrupting it. Uh, so here our focus really is about uh, keeping, keeping the focus on becoming an anti-racist organization. This is not new work for us. We have been focusing on this for several years now. So this is a reinforced approach to the, to the work. Um, and our work primarily is um, kind of falls into two categories. No matter if you look at it from an economic development or an urban development standpoint, primarily with lever on our strategic plan through programs and investments. And we have been approaching our work through, you know, adding equity lenses, or utilizing equity lenses by leading with race, by doing a benefits analysis or asking ourselves who benefits, a question that is, you know, is, is widely used in our organization. And we have, we are introducing the concept of targeted universalism to Prosper Portland, yet it's not a new concept. It really conveys a lot of the work that we have been doing as an organization. And it refers to, you know, ultimately what we want to see is improvements for every, every person in Portland. Um, but we, on, or, and we understand that in order to achieve that, we really need to prioritize communities that have been deeply impacted by obstacles, racism, institutional racist strategies, you name it. And we understand that we, if, if we focus our, our time, our resources, and our efforts in specific communities that have, that have been traditionally disadvantaged and excluded from wealth creation opportunities and businesses, uh, we fundamentally will be cre uh, recreating or reshaping the system and making it more inclusive for everybody as a whole. So in some ways, 
This is not a new way of doing our work. This is a concept that really describes how we have been focusing on doing our work for several years now. So the focus on, on our work is to really uh, to, to focus on inclusive growth and addressing persistent gaps within our, the city of Portland and our work. So given these three main things, uh, there we know that there are internal and external factors that um, really influence the impact of our work and our ability to deliver on our efforts on our strategic plan. We have internal factors, which is our staff. The focus is on, on creating a learning organization. So here is where we're, we have been really focusing on staff, diversity and inclusion, on increasing our cultural competency and having really good governance practices, meaning it's, things are transparent, there's transparent, there's clarity of roles, we know what we're doing, what's the accountability, what's the expectation. On an, if you go to the blue part of the, uh, the left side of the slide, this is where the external factors play a role, which is our community. The focus there is on accountability and collaboration. So here is where our public engagement matters. You know, we're striving to have inclusive, equitable uh, community engagement practices. We're reinforcing on evaluation and monitoring um, as an organization, you know, by really focusing on human-centered outcomes and looking at our impact and what's the story, how are, not only what's the story, but what's the experience people are having when interacting with us as an organization. Those are very critical pieces of information that are very important for us. And lastly, uh, to really focus on partnerships. So partnerships and, you know, with uh, advisory bodies like, bodies like Siri, with community stakeholders, with organizations that we work with, really focusing on building trust and relationships. Um, so that's our uh, model for change. And at the end of the framework introduction, I'll um, open the floor for questions. But um, the next slide really is about, okay, how do we then activate this model and who plays what role within the model? So ultimately, as you can see in the background, all those faces, that's to symbolize our staff. Every single person that works at Prosper Portland is, you know, we all play a, play a role in that. Internal, external factors and how we do our work, you know, all that, we're all reflected. And at the same time, we have different uh, kind of pockets within the organization that have different layers, layers of accountability in how we're implementing our work. So we have our staff, as you see there, which is as a whole, we are all working to embody culture change. And then we have our executive team, uh, which is the primary focus is on accountability. How are we setting expectation, context, context clarity for staff? Um, we have the equity council, who is now um, repositioned to really focus on advancing internal culture change work. The equity governance and communications department, um, which is primarily we're focusing on organizational culture and capacity building. We also have human resources, as I've shared before. Uh, their primary role in this work is around staff hiring and retention practices. And then we also have management as a whole, which is in supporting staff in the implementation day-to-day -day operations of really, as Rana said, like giving the space and you know the 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 yeah, the space and the ability to really say, okay, are we being as thoughtful and equitable and looking at all the factors and things that we need to consider before making a decision? And um, so, I'll, I, if, if there are any specific questions about the framework, um, I, you know, happy taken. If not, we can move to uh, the next. It's related to this: the equity priorities and strategies work. I'm, I'm curious in these different, I'll call them verticals um, within the, the equitable. This the next slide or the prior one? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, community, uh, work focus, staff, etc. If you had to choose one of them, where the you feel there are more pinch points, right? Whether you're finding there's a little bit more work to do than in the other ones, which of those three would? Within the internal and external factors? Uh-huh, yeah. I will say as staff in uh, retention, yeah. staff retention primarily for staff of color. Yeah. Um, and that will be my highest priority within a very top layer mm -hmm. of priorities. Mm -hmm. um, and from a community standpoint, I will say the public engagement. I think yeah. that communities are dynamic and um, you know, needs and opportunities are ever changing and ever evolving. And the, we are one organization in a system of organizations and policies and practices and markets. And so we only have so much control and influence. However, we do have certain level of control and influence. So 
it is in our best interest to really go out of our way to focus and say, okay, what are we really trying to achieve? How are we communicating? Um, what are we hoping to get? What do we need to, um, the information we need or what's the level of influence this community is gonna have or this advisory body? And so just providing a lot of clarity and a lot of front, like these are the things we have to work with. These are our constraints. You know, and so we like the more we clarify the process that we sometimes also have to follow. Um, I think just providing that access and clarity to this is how it works, and this is these are the areas where you can influence, where you can advise, and how that, as Court mentioned, how are we looping back with community? I think there's a lot of really important work to keep doing, and we have been focusing a lot on advancing those practices. Now Court is going to talk about equity priorities and strategies. Great, um, so just um, some context around my role. So my role is to, um, in addition to all the great work Myra does, um, be the really frontline staff support. Um, so I do a couple things. I support Siri along with Myra, as well as the Equity Council. Um, I also am working on these learning lab um, opportunities for staff, which are monthly learning lab sessions around different uh, topics like microaggressions, et cetera. Um, and also um, sponsoring an equity collective, how can I create tables for staff to come together who are um, having a lot of the same issues. Um, and then another key uh, part of my role was to come up with an agency equity plan. And so um, I saw when I first got to Prosper that there was a really great sort of big picture vision, but something that can happen um, is really getting into the weeds as the next step and process of equity work um, so that it doesn't feel bottlenecked and staff really feel like they can bite into equity work um, no matter what part of the, what cubicle you're in. <laughs> so that's really where I wanted to start. So what I did is um, my first few months here, I interview, um, interviewed every staff member in the building, had 85 interviews um, to ask some really important questions. You know, how is equity work landing for you? Um, where do you think we're still creating harm as an agency? Where do you think we're doing really well? Um, what are some opportunities that you see? What do you do here? <laughs> um, and um, how do you think equity could impact that work? Um, so that was a really great process to, to get a general landscape of, you know, how do we need to start um, implementing equity work in the roles and where do, where do some folks really confident, confident about it and where do we need to provide further resources? Um, and then as Myra mentioned, we had uh, folks uh, do an equity impact of their individual work plans, um, which is also a really great process. Um, and for some folks, that was something that they were really used to articulating. And for other folks, they're like, these are, some, these are some interesting questions, and I'm not really sure I know how to do that. And so that was a really great process um, to be, so, um, we were both you know, kind of on deck for p folks uh, who had questions around that. But ultimately, I was able to look at all those equity pieces of individual work plans. Um, and then I, I looked at the agency strategic plan, and I sort of braided those three things together to produce an equity inventory of Prosper Portland. Um, and specifically also able to narrow that down into team equity profiles so that I could come back to teams and say, okay, here's what came up for you and your team. Here's the questions you all have together. Um, and then from there, I thought it was really important to um, have folks that are on the front lines who are experts in the day-to-day -day really kind of make that decision um, with their managers on what is our team-driven equity priority. And so um, what you see as an addendum document is all the different teams um, equity priorities. So that document is not meant to capture all of our equity work. It's really to get into the weeds of what is each team's um, strategic goal for this year to advance equity and to su support that um, bigger vision strategic plan. So was able to add sort of a 25,000 foot and kind of 50 foot <laughs> view of like um, under every rock, where does equity show up um, for the agency? So I was really excited about that process. Um, some of the themes that came up were um, around internal culture change. You know, folks want to be better and do better internally so that we can increase community access to our programs, um, so that we can create a culture that um, is inviting and inclusive to folks as we do our business. And as Myra's mentioning, you know, how do we move from being more transaction-based to a more relational-based? Um, and then, you know, just generally, how can we increase our awareness and knowledge of communities of color? Um, what assumptions are we making? Um, so those, those are some elements that showed up for a lot of teams. Um, other folks, uh, you know, really want to track and measure that equity pro uh, progress, as you were talking about. So how can we um, have uh, stories of equity impact as well as numbers of equity impact? Um, how do we measure if we're making progress? And um, in a lot of ways, we already do that. But in some ways, we, we realize we could do it better or do more of it. 
Um, and also, how can we um, identify and reduce any harmful um, impacts, even if the intent is good, um, to our programs or, or projects? Um, and as we were talking about, you know, the, there's a lot of folks in the private sector right now who are hungry for culture change work. Um, and through Portland Means Progress and other programs, you know, there's, there's so many different programs in this building that are really trying to use all those levers to invite the private sector, who's already really hungry on how to do these culture change in, um, initiatives. But there's not a ton of, like, resources out there, or culture change libraries, and we all don't kind of agree on a model of change for the city of Portland. So how can we work across um, our teams to make sure that we're providing those resources for the private sector? So that I think there's a lot of team priorities um, that are really interested in that. We obviously want to continue to support wealth creation opportunities for communities of color. Um, we talked about POC workforce um, and ensuring that our stakeholders can provide feedbacks, uh, feedback on our approaches and, and have some actually authentic influence in the, in the work that we do. Um, we want to be good bureau partners. We want to do things like ensure the community has the information, you know, even talking to the, the budget and accounting team, like how can we make our budget uh, more transparent? How could you talk to your uh, mother-in-law about TIFF, you know, that's kind of the test for me is, um, you know, is the language that we're using um, accessible? Do people know what's behind the curtain? Because I think I've seen a lot of folks who want, who have the hunger to show that information, but we also need to know how to translate it in a way um, that's really accessible to different folks. So um, I'm really excited to work with the teams moving forward on these um, priorities. You know, it's a learning space for teams, so sometimes, you know, we might have a a goal that uh, really actually takes three years. Um, but I think that the process itself was really informed by the experts on the front lines. Um, and then with Siri as a partner, we really have um, some really great um, perspective kind of across the realm of um, you know, the, the big picture view, how is this landing with the community, and then really having that staff voice of frontline experts um, who, who know day to day how equity is popping up in their heads and their cubicles. So um, I'll take any questions on that if folks have them. And, and I believe, Ron, I would like to share some comments oh, as well. Yeah, um, Yeah, I, I would like to share some. I want to add a little bit to Myra's response to your question. I do agree completely that uh, community involvement is important in retention. But to speak to community involvement, something that I've seen, I'm not from Portland originally. I'm from New York City originally. And in, in Portland, equity work is done at a very high level. It's pretty refreshing. In New York City, is the opposite. But something that I've found is this high-level equity work isn't going down to the community. It's not trickling down. It's up at very high levels around this initiative, this resource, funds, opportunities, grants that aren't being, that people in the community don't know. And I think it's, it's, it's exactly what Myra said, along with just transparency and, and repetition making sure that one person coming to a meeting after some time may turn to two, may turn to four, may turn to eight. I think that's super important. And something that I don't see when, it, when retention is spoken of is, is, is making sure that if you're hiring staff of color, that you have management that reflect these, these staff that understand cultural norms and, and, and can able to relate in a very different way. Uh, trainings help. Trainings do help. You help staff that uh, may not identify as people of color to help. But more often than not, something that I would like to see a change and a push is hiring more management, higher level um, systems thinkers of people that are, are people of color to give them that opportunity. They are out there. They just have been overlooked, overseen, ignored. I think that some really smart people, people of color, non-people of color, however they identify, but if we're looking at retention, we're looking at keeping people of color, making sure their job satisfaction and quality of life are strong, is, in, is promoting current staff internally, definitely, promoting them to higher levels where they are managing these individuals so they can help give them professional development and grooming so later on they can hold similar position, if not a different one. Thanks, Rana. Thank you. I'd, I'd simply like to support that that perspective. I think um, my my own um, academic training is is in management, and and any any number of studies will tell you that most of the most of the cultural change uh, and innovation happens at the middle management level, not at the top, not at the bottom. It's in that critical critical middle, um, and uh, so I agree with that emphasis. And I also, having lived here for, off and on for twenty years, um, I agree with your assessment. I lived in New York for a short amount of time, and and uh, 
Uh, you're just not, I think, in, in Portland exposed as much as in New York City to diversity on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think people can easily feel isolated and not in touch, right, with the different sources that are available, as you said, at a higher level, but they need to find their way there. Um, so we need to clarify those pathways and, 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 and narrow that gap. Mm -hmm. um, I do think, um, just looking at the material um, already, I think there's already a lot of usable things here. There's some documents here I'm like, I'm taking that, I'm taking that back, right? Because this is, this is behavioral focus, which I think is the right approach, because it does, at the end of the day, come down to that. How do people behave and treat one another, right? Day to day. And so having these tools and, and using these tools, modeling these tools and sharing these tools, I think for me constitutes progress. It's, mm -hmm. it's something you can share, right? Something you can look at, touch, right? And so I, I, I totally support all of the work that you're doing and then a focus on these things that you can enact now, right? That a, that a, a small entrepreneur or, or a you know, big shot manager at a Fortune 500 could say, you know what, I can use this at work, right? And go ahead and start doing it and practicing it. So, so thank you for doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, this is great. I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed with all the work that's gone into this too. It's a tremendous effort. Um, I think what I'm most excited about is just seeing where this leads us and to what extent we can see sort of tangible results and changes that might come out of it. And I know that some of that will be uh, brought to us by our new hire. Uh, that we're excited about, welcome, <laughs> uh, because we'll hopefully get some data and some things that, especially at the board level, we could look at and say, yeah, this is this is a, a change and an inflection point. So anyway, thanks very much for your great work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. okay, so um, what's next in, is in, in the agenda is bringing forward the uh, proposed amendments to the existing social equity policy. So there are four main things that we're bringing forward today is, or want to highlight as, a, uh, as part of the amendments is that it retitles it as an equity policy. It now is in alignment of our equity framework. It simplifies language for transparency um, externally, but primarily internally. Um, and it really reflects staff input on how the policy aligns with their um, agency work. So those are the main key um, highlights I wanted to share. <laughs> <laughs> Further comments? <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. All right. Okay. Well, if we have no further comments or questions or anything else you'd like to add, we'll we'll go ahead and vote. That. I think I'll just add something that's really um, not. You can't put it in data, but it Frost are starting to feel better and feel different. You know, when you go into work every day, and that's just something that I think like our community is feeling. We're having better conversations. We're having braver conversations. Um, and I'm really honored because I get to see all those conversations with different people every day. So having hundreds and hundreds of those little moments in the last eight months or nine months that I've been here, I just wanted to thank everyone for all of um, their hard work, Myra's work, Kimberly's work, Rana's work, um, and staff's work. And it just, if it's getting, it feels um, more exciting. And that's something you just can't put data around. So. Yeah. And I just also want to thank, as we said, uh, Rana and Cole, who couldn't be here, but also Court, and all their efforts and energy and spirit and humanity that uh, Court has brought to the organization. And uh, we just are really thankful for your approach. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, this seems to get better and better. And it's like Rana saying, maybe it's re repetition is part of it, right? <laughs> that helps. <yeah. laughs> you know, we just keep saying it, keep doing it, and eventually it starts to materialize. So. So great, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, great. Okay, all right, we will go ahead then and uh, would someone like to make a motion uh, to approve resolution number 7335? So moved. Thank you. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, we have an updated social equity policy. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's see, next we have action item number 11, which is authorizing the Lentz Town Center phase two project. And Allison Wicks and Laura Alcinas will join us. Thank you, You're all, you've already joined us. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. All right. Uh, 
good afternoon, Chair Cruz, Commissioners, Executive Director Branham. My name is Allison Wicks, and I'm the Project Manager for the Lentz Town Center Phase Two Project. Uh, and I'm Laura Alcinas. I'm one of the loan officers here at Prosper Portland. Um, and today we'll present a set of action items to approve the terms of the Lentz Town Center Phase Two Project. Um, I was last here in April for a work session with the board and then in May for a summary of the public engagement process. Um, so I'm happy to be here today with a set of action items. Um, so as you know, Lenstown Center Phase 2 is a 4.8 acre um, Prosper Portland owned site in Lentz Town Center. It's located on 92nd Avenue between um, Southeast Ramona and Southeast Herald. Um, the set of actions today includes two resolutions and is a set of three land transactions. Um, the first two are with Palindrome Communities and the last is with um, the Portland Housing Bureau. So for the bakery blocks property, we're asking for authorization for the sale of the property along with, the, um, along with a development loan. For 92nd and Herald, the action will um, authorize the negotiation and execution of development agreement and a 99-year land lease. And then for Block F, it'll um, authorize the negotiation and execution of a land transfer agreement with the Portland Housing Bureau. Um, I'll next review the development plan and public benefits for each part of the site. Uh, the bakery blocks will include the redevelopment of existing buildings into a neighborhood commercial center. Um, public benefits include a public plaza and a home for the Lentz International Farmers Market. Um, also a home for the Green Lentz Tool Library. They're already located there, but looking at a 10-year lease at a dollar per year. Um, also available tenant improvement grants to support diverse businesses in the future renovated commercial space. And then we're also asking the developer to work with the Regional Arts and Culture Council to develop a public art element for the plaza. Um, 92nd and Herald will include the development of approximately 244 residential rental apartment units um, in two phases. And the public benefits include the City of Portland's inclusionary housing policy, and we're requiring palindrome communities to provide the affordable units on site. Um, and they'll work with PHB also to explore the reconfiguration option, which allows for more two bedroom and three bedroom family sized units. Um, we've also asked the developer to create a residential marketing plan that will be approved by Prosper Portland um, to market the new apartment units. Um, then for Block F, we're planning to transfer the half-acre site to the Portland Housing Bureau at no cost. Um, PHB will then make the site available for development of affordable housing via a future notice of funding available. Um, all sites will comply with all applicable Prosper Portland policies, including workforce equity, business equity, and green building policy, as well as state of Oregon statutes, including prevailing wage laws. Um, when phase two is constructed, it will complete a vision for a vibrant Lentz Town Center um, set, out at the, um, set out in the Lentz five-year action plan. The project will advance Prosper Portland's strategic plan by creating a vibrant community and corridor and by advancing affordability and prosperity. Um, throughout the process, we've connected with community um, through engagement and partnership. Um, so just as a reminder of where we've come from, um, this is the Lentz Town Center Phase Two timeline. So starting in um, 2014 with the adoption of the Lentz Five-Year Action Plan by City Council. Um, then we released a request for proposals for Phase One in, two, in late 2014, and then saw um, Phase One construction start um, between 2016 and 2018, and there's four projects that we consider phase one, which included the addition on of over 250 apartment units, 77% which are affordable or workforce units. Um, in May 2017, we entered into a memorandum of understanding with Palindrome Communities for the phase two site. And then as you know, over the last, over this past fall, we, um, organized an intensive community engagement process, which included um, in-language focus groups, small-scale community conversations, um, a web-based open house, and an in-person open house. 
And then we're here today seeking approval of the land transactions. And over the next year, um, the project would move through design review and um, construction starting early next year. Um, the conversations in the public engagement process really focused on community values and public benefits. What we heard from the community was incorporated into and had a real impact on the shape of the project that we're presenting today. Um, this includes a community desire for a public gathering space, um, for support of the Lentz International Farmers Market, to support the Green Lentz Tool Library, um, to support businesses that reflect the Lentz community and are owned by communities of color. Um, and we also heard from the community both a desire to see more affordable housing than just inclusionary in the project and the desire to see a balance of the amount of affordable and market rate housing between phase one and phase two. Um, as proposed, the project when combined um, both phases, um, so phase one of Lenstown Center and phase two, there'll be about 50% market rate units and 50% affordable units, about 550 units total. Um, now I'll hand it over to Laura to talk about the financial considerations of the project and the associated public benefits. Yeah, I'd like to go through the anticipated transactions and then the Prosper Portland investment um, that would flow from the proposed actions. Um, for the bakery blocks, we're proposing extending a 15-year loan for the property purchase uh, in the amount of approximately $2.4 million. Uh, the property itself appraised at $2.9 million, um, but the purchase price reflects the land write-downs um, for the public benefits that Allison described, around $290,000 for uh, permanent deed restrictions for the public plaza to be placed on the land, as well as approximately $164,000 for the value of the 10-year lease uh, for the tool library. Um, and then the, it also includes about 54,000 um, write down for environmental remediation on the property um, for a total reduction um, from the appraised value of about $500,000. Um, additionally, Prosper Portland would contribute up to $300,000 for actual pro public plaza improvements um, and would make available tenant improvement grants uh, for the newly renovated uh, commercial space for eligible businesses. On the 92nd and Herald property, uh, we're proposing a 99-year ground lease um, that supports Prosper Portland's long-term financial sustainability, and we would not be participating um, subsequently in the transactions with any additional debt or uh, subsidy. Um, and then finally, for Block F, um, the transfer to PHB um, includes um, a transfer of land value of about $1.3 million. Um, so if approved today, our next steps would be to finalize agreements with Palindrome Communities and the Portland Housing Bureau. Um, then Palindrome would start Kazine with phased construction starting as early as spring 2020. And that's it. <laughs> we have um, a couple of uh, resources here. So um, Chad Renneker from Palindrome Communities, as well as Jill Chen from the Portland Housing Bureau, and then... Um, Trudy from the farmer's market. Okay, great. Do you have questions now or do you want to have public comment first? I just have a quick question. Yeah. Um, what steps have we taken to ensure that our workforce training and hiring policies and equitable contracting policy are going to be met on this phase? I'm assuming that's kind of in um, relation to some issues with uh, the Oliver Station phase before. So I think. I'll, I can let um, Palindrome speak to this more, but they've mm -hmm. kind of, That's fine. yeah, okay. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay, great, thank you. Okay, would um, Chad Renneker from Palindrome and Trudy Tolliver from Portland Farmers Market like to join us? Oh, yeah, <laughs> come on up. <laughs> I can see this better than the screen. That's great. <laughs> well, thanks for having us today. My name is Chad Renneker. I'm the president of Palindrome, and I'm here with Robert Gibson, the guy that really does the work at Palindrome. And and I, you know, I want to really all I want to say is thank you to uh, my staff, including Robert, and uh, and and all the hard work that was done by uh, Allison and Laura. Um, I 
you know, pretty much exclusively at Palindrome, we do private public partnerships. And I can't think of a better example of a private public partnership than the one we're, that we're having with uh, Prosper Portland on this project. It's been, um, if you don't know, this has been an incredible amount of work that's been done by your staff to get this to this point where it is today. I've never seen as much outreach uh, on a project as we've had on this one. And it's if anyone's ever, I'm sure you have, been to neighborhood meetings, you know how hard that is to do. And, um, and so I think they really need to be commended for the work that they did and have done. Um, the other thing I want to just the stress on this is that, you know, I often get, people often comment to me that, wow, you guys have really done a lot of work in Lentz and it's really arrived. And, and it, this impression that somehow the work that was intended to be done there is done. And I always scratch my head and think, you know, there's still so much work that has to be done. And it sort of reminded me of the proposal that we put together five years ago when we first put to, we proposed our conceptual plan for the area. And we, someone mentioned the five-year lens plan. And it, it's ironic that this was just short of five years ago that we actually presented this conceptual plan. And, you know, this image that's on the front cover here are of my three boys when they were young and, and they're at, at a, a fountain here in Portland. And this image really captured for me what we wanted to accomplish in Lentz with the plaza. And the plaza, in my mind, was always the most important part of this whole redevelopment. We spent a lot of energy and, and the city has spent a lot of money on what we consider the commercial energy of the Lentz Town Center. And we've done a fantastic job of creating really good commercial energy out on 92nd Foster. But what's been lacking is that transitional phase that we called it in our proposal and the relationship with the neighborhood to the north. So the plaza area to us was always the critical piece of our whole master plan. And so today is a very, a very important step towards that. And I want to thank everyone for that. And I'm very glad that we're here today. Judy? Yeah, thank you. So good afternoon. Chair Cruz and members of the commission. So I'm Trudy Tolliver. I'm the executive director at Portland Farmers Market. Um, we operate the downtown Portland State University market every Saturday of the year. And we have four other markets. One of them is the Lentz International Market on Sundays, May through November. Please come visit if you've not been there on a Sunday quite yet this season. And that is located on um, 92nd and Reed Way in the brewery block. Is that what we're in? No, bakery, bakery. block. Bakery. It's yeah. It's a brewery now. <laughs> <laughs> it's next to Zweigel House, which has been great. So um, thank you, though, for having me today and let, letting me speak about that market and the impact that it's had. We do lease that land from Prosper Portland at this time. So at that market, we have... Uh, we do a lot to celebrate diversity. It turns out now that nearly 90% of the small businesses that vend with us are owned by people of color or other immigrants. And that's a number we've kind of grown to in the four years since we took that market over. And we're quite proud of it. Um, last year, we started a project where we bought um, national flags from all of the nations that our vendors represent, and we put them up. And this year, we had a new vendor join us. Her business name is Spice of Africa. And um, when we were chatting with her, she said, um, well, will you be able to get a, a flag from Kenya? And we said, oh, already on order. They just didn't have it in stock. She was thrilled. We were thrilled. It's a silly story, but it indicates the forward thinking we're trying to employ when it comes to keeping that market a good reflection of the community from a business perspective as well as to support shoppers. So over the few years, um, three or so that we've been running this, we've been working with Robert and we've been talking about de the development of a plaza for quite some time. We're committed to seeing that through. We stay in touch. Um, we've talked with them about our infrastructure infrastructure needs, water, shopper amenities, power, et cetera. And just recently, I've learned of the $300,000 grant that apparently needs a nonprofit partner, and we are 100% eager to join in and be that partner. And honestly, to help influence the development of the plaza um, so that it can accommodate a farmer's market. And I know that if it can do that, it can accommodate a lot of other events or other public uses as well. So we're, we're happy to be, like I said, a part of that. Um, the other thing about having a plaza and a space that is dedicated to a farmer's market is that it will allow us to operate the market maybe on a longer, longer 
num uh, length of season. And the longer we can offer the farmer's market, the better um, prosperity and wealth. I saw one of your points is to increase the wealth of um, businesses owned by people of color. We can help do that for these small businesses. We can also then allow the neighbors of the area to be able to rely on access to fresh, healthy food on a much more regular basis. Because as you probably know, that community lacks a grocery nearby. Thank you very much. I think that about sums up, and I'd be happy to take any questions you have. I, I can respond to Commissioner Meyer's question about the, uh, the, the compliance. I think it was a lesson learned for us. This was the first new construction project of the scale that we've worked on under the Prosper Portland um, policy requirements. And I think we underestimated, and certainly our general contractor who we expected to comply with the requirements, underestimated the amount of staff time that it required. So I think going forward, we've determined that not only on palindrome staff, but also on whatever contractor, general contractor we select, that they need to have a dedicated person to meet those compliance um, requirements. On a project where you have a $30 million construction contract, it's a full-time job for someone, and it really can't be done as a, a side assignment for someone, and that's really where I think there was some um, challenges on the last project. So we recognize that, and as we make our contractor selection going forward, we uh, will definitely keep that in the forefront. Thank you very much for the answer, and then please don't hesitate to reach out to the staff here uh, for any time that you see a roadblock or a stumbling block that you come up against, and be sure to help out. So, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Quick question about this, the uh, plaza. You know, I'm really excited about that. I like squares, I like plazas. Um, how will that be maintained? What's your plan for that? And, and who will do the programming for that? Because you'll have the farmer's market, but then you'll also have hopefully other activities and who will pick up the ball to get people in that space and keep it going? Because that always seems to be an issue with plazas and squares is, who pays for the upkeep and who keeps stuff happening there? So. Well, I think on the upkeep side, it's the benefit that we have is that we own a business adjacent to it. So we're vested in making sure that our backyard is always looking good or our front yard in this case. Sure. So the, um, the maintenance and upkeep will be palindrome's um, requirement. Um, and so that, that's how we're gonna handle the maintenance and we'll have you know, security and oversight through our management of our brewery operation. Right. As far as the programming, um, we see a, a partnership with um, the farmer's market for um, and expanding on um, the program as we go forward beyond just the market days. But then also um, we have event coordinators at the brewery that can um, do that. Because we really see, you know, we want to have an exciting active uh, plaza. We don't just want an empty space, you know, and it looks pretty, we want to have it be used. And so we'll also be involved in the programming. Great. I can, I, I'll let me add to that because I, I, I wanted you to answer the first part of it because that's news to me that we have to maintain. No, <laughs> <laughs> There's so. cost to that. That's why I asked the question. <laughs> but but the, second, the second part of the question I wanted to answer because this isn't the first time we've done a project like this. Um, we have a similar project in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where we have a plaza area that is adjacent to a business of our own, and we really take that responsibility seriously because it really adds to the viability of, of our business. Um, you know, people bring, people are what bring energy to real estate, and so you need to really program those areas to get people there, and so we spend a lot of energy at the plaza we have in New Mexico bringing live uh, performances there, bringing movies at night. I mean, we want that place to be active all the time because it helps everyone around it. And, and there's nothing worse than an empty plaza. That's very depressing. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. This is exciting, really, for everybody. Super. Thank you for your good work. Thank you. Any more comments, questions? No? Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do we uh, want Allison and Laura to come back? Or are we good? No? Okay. Well, I would. We'll have to have a motion to approve. Uh, which number is it? Uh, resolutions number looks like 7328 and 7329. 7329. Yeah. Thank you. So move to okay. approve both. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes. So thank you. Thanks for your great work. Okay. So uh, now to item 12.
the, meet, the meeting of the Prosper Portland Board of Commission, Commissioners excuse me, is now adjourned. The members of the Prosper Portland Board will now meet as the agency's local contract review board to consider the next item on the agenda. All right. What, quick break? Okay, okay, all right. Okay, uh, so this item, this is an action item adopting actions to advance the U.S. Postal Service Retail Relocation Project. So, welcome, Amy. <laughs> Shall we? Uh, You'll have to inform me on protocol. Do we wait for executive director? Yeah, we'll wait, we'll wait okay. for executive director. <laughs> I assume so. <laughs> yeah. Right. We don't wait? Oh, I have a stretch. I thought we'd. Do you want to wait? Do you want to wait? Okay. Well, we can. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, please continue. Okay. Chair Cruz, commissioners. <laughs> um, I have before you um, a, a request to adopt the three actions. Uh, one, to exempt the interim USPS retail post office design services contract from competitive solicitation to authorize the design services contract with GBD Architects and approving a green building policy exemption and to exempt the interim USPS retail post office construction manager general contractor contract from low bid solicitation. Um, these, uh, three, uh, the, these actions will advance the design and construction of interim USPS retail post office facility, which is approximately uh, 15,000 square feet in the ground floor of the parking garage that's currently on Prosper Portland owned property at the northeast corner of Northwest Hoyt and 9th Avenue. Planning for the redevelopment of Broadway Corridor represents one of Prosper Portland's most significant opportunities for advancing our strategic plan goals. Specifically, constructing the USPS interim retail facility will advance multiple strategic plan goals, including creating healthy, complete neighborhoods by allowing for the redevelopment of the Broadway Corridor as a mixed-use, transit-oriented employment and residential center. Uh, this action also supports the agency's financial sustainability goals, accelerating the development, uh, mitigating management costs, expediting our ability to sell property in the Broadway corridor, and to repay our line of credit with the city of Portland. So to put it in context, this is the timeline for the uh, Broadway Corridor project, and you can see the third item is the USPS relocation. Uh, because the uh, USPS has moved their processing operations to the new Colwood facility, uh, we have engaged in a process by which we have um, explored our options to relocate the retail facility to a another location so that we can keep on our timeline for the demolition of the main building and thereby facilitate um, the development. As you can see through the development planning and imp implementation section, we are wrapping up uh, or have wrapped up the master plan process and we're going into the agreements and design and permitting process. So by advancing these actions, we keep to our timeline. So just by way of background and context, we entered into a purchase and sale agreement with USPS. And uh, in that agreement, we have the obligation um, to uh, keep the retail facility in the current building until such time as we have identified um, and constructed a permanent replacement facility. However, USPS has agreed to work with Prosper Portland to relocate to an interim facility in advance of identifying that permanent site, which would enable Prosper Portland to proceed with the demolition of the processing and distribution center and therefore expedite its redevelopment. The purchase and sale agreement with the USPS includes a retail services plan, and this is a detailed plan which, among other specifications, indicates a geographic boundary by which, um, in which a permanent retail facility would have to be located. So in the fall of last year, we engaged JLL to complete an assessment of our options for such relocation. 
And in March of 2019, we contracted with GBD Architects, who then subcontracted to Cornerstone Architects through our flexible services uh, program to create a conceptual test fit um, within that first floor of that parking garage that I mentioned. Um, this was formerly USPS employee parking, but it's now authorized for public parking. Prosper Portland selected GBD and Cornerstone because Cornerstone is one of the three architectural firms on USPS's uh, version of, our, of their flexible services list um, approved for the Pacific Northwest. And the team of GBD and Cornerstone designed the most recent the downtown core retail facility in Portland for the USPS. Uh, Cornerstone Architects has been providing architectural services to the USPS since 1993. So um, Prosper Portland and uh, the USPS are in agreement that the conceptual plan that was created uh, appears to meet the needs of the post office and they have not surfaced any significant issues with the site. Therefore, we're in agreement to continue the design process pending your approval. So the first action would be a design services exemption. And pursuant to ORS and LCRB rules, we feel an exemption is consistent with the findings um, that it would not encourage favoritism and that it would result in significant cost savings. Uh, because of the unique program and uh, the site challenges, um, a specialized configuration of the retail facility, um, it's important to have a design team that's not only familiar with the USPS specs, but it's also familiar with the challenges associated, associated with constructing such a facility in the downtown core. And we feel that by retaining this team that uh, has completed the conceptual design, we realize cost savings um, by expediting the design process and avoiding costly delays to the overall project. The next action is associated with the GBD contract and green building exemption. Um, the contract is contemplated at a cost of $550,000, that's a do not exceed sum, and it would include such items such as schematic design, uh, design development and the des uh, city design review, uh, construction drawings, uh, permitting, um, con construction administration, all the way through to substantial completion. The green building policy uh, in force at Prosper Portland requires that a project of this size and scope achieve LEED silver certification. However, due to the interim nature of the facility, we seek an exemption to this policy. It's contemplated that USPS will be in this interim facility for approximately 10 years, and it's possible that that time frame could be shortened depending on the, pro uh, the progress of development activity. The master plan contemplates the demolition of the parking structure so that the redevelop redevelopment of the southern part of the property can occur. And we see that no sustainable reason to require LEED Silver certification um, and such certification would add design and construction costs to the overall project. The third action is associated with uh, the design build uh, contract that we would like to and, um, issue a request for proposal for. Um, as we, I previously mentioned, uh, we're coordinating closely with USPS uh, on the design approvals and construction process. We expect uh, construction costs to be approximately $3.75 million. We're asking for an exemption because we believe issuing an RFP for a construction manager, general contractor, or CMGC, will result in cost savings over a low bid contract. Um, and that's primarily due to the site and project specific factors. Um, first, it's an existing parking structure, and because of the challenges associated with retrofitting the parking structure to accommodate the retail facility, it's going to require close coordination between the owner, um, the contractor, and the parking operator. So a low bid um, contract would not allow such close coordination, 
and we feel that um, that is something that's required in this case. Furthermore, we are having we have uh, the complication or challenge associated with having the retail facility still in existence and operation right next to the parking garage, and therefore we're going to uh, continue to work closely with USPS to mitigate challenges associated with the construction, including uh, noise, dust, etc. Um, and we feel that the GM, uh, the CMGC. Uh, contract would allow us to establish a plan to mitigate that, uh, mitigate those challenges. So we're planning to come back to the board to seek approval of the CMGC contract in late 2019. The equity impact um, Prosper Portland has established a 20% utilization goal for both professional services and hard construction costs. And we acknowledge that the majority of the design work will be performed by GBD and Cornerstone. However, GBD has successfully partnered with certified firms for mechanical and structural engineering. Um, further, we intend to exceed the 20% threshold for hard construction contracting. Approving the aforementioned actions will serve to mitigate the budget uh, deficit that's projected in the River District um, in our five-year forecast by advancing the redevelopment activities, thereby mitigating the holding costs and generating revenue through property sales. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Questions? No? No? Okay. No, I think we're good. Thank you. Okay, would someone like to make a motion? Chair Cruz, can I just yes, make a quick please. comment? Sorry. Um, so I want to recognize the team who's made this happen. It sounds very um, succinct and efficient, and it's been a very creative problem-solving process. I also want to acknowledge and appreciate the post office, who is being a great partner in recognizing that in order for us to move forward with the vision that I think they're also excited about, we are doing, um, taking a different approach than was anticipated. So I just wanna appreciate Amy and the entire team, John Wasserman, um, everyone who's been involved as well as the leadership at the post office and we're looking forward to making this happen. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, would someone like to make a motion to approve resolutions number 7332, 7333, and 7334 related to the interim U.S. Postal Service office so location? Second. Thank you. All right. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Okay. Passing unanimously. Thank you. I have a double header too, so I'll stay put. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let me, yes. Do you want to gavel out for Yes. Are you still working with the call? Okay. When, did we were, when were we going to call? We're calling about four minutes. Four minutes. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll gavel out then. The meeting of the Prosper Portland Local Contract Review Board is now adjourned and the meeting of the Prosper Portland Board of Commissioners is reconvened and we'll take a very short break for like four or five minutes.
Amy, would you like to Thank go you. forward? Thank you. Chair Cruz, Commissioner, Executive Director. Declare first. Chair Cruz, Executive <laughs> Director Branham, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Amy Edwards. I'm the Asset and Investment Manager. And I'm here to request the board authorize the Executive Director to enter into exclusive lease negotiations for a 10 year lease at 220 Northwest 2nd Avenue. This aligns with our strategic plan uh, by maintaining the agency's presence in Old Town Chinatown, operating an equitable, innovative, and financially sustainable agency, and it's consistent with the agency's financial sustainability goals. For background, uh, we have a current lease that expires on June 30 of 2020. Our goal in this exercise was to identify a cost-effective office space with a program that aligns with our agency values. Back in September of 2018, we issued an RFP for brokerage services. And based on the responses to that RFP, we chose Apex Real Estate Services. Uh, they are based here in Old Town, Chinatown, and uh, to our knowledge, uh, the only minority-owned commercial real estate brokerage in Portland. Between November of 2018 and August of this year, Apex and Prosper Portland engaged in an iterative process of identifying and evaluating prospective sites eventually creating a shortlist with whom we conducted space planning exercises and tenant improvement pricing. Uh, that allowed us to gain a complete picture of both the financial and programmatic merits and considerations. And we're here to uh, before the board to request authority to enter into lease negotiations with the landlord of 220 Northwest 2nd Avenue. We found uh, that 220 was the most fiscally prudent and programmatically sound option for the agency. Primarily from a programming point of view, uh, this move allows us to initiate a fresh start and to be consistent with our cultural uh, change objectives, to live fully into our cultural values um, and to fulfill our equity goals and priorities. Um, we do that by moving all staff to one floor, uh, which uh, addresses the concerns that staff have expressed around being in silos and um, being separated from uh, decision makers. Uh, further, the uh, layout of being on all one floor allows for collaborative areas, which facilitates increased efficiency and productivity and um, a greater exchange uh, of communication and ideas. A no newly renovated building, um, the uh, landlord of 220 Northwest 2nd Avenue is planning to um, invest approximately $14.5 million into the building, both the interior and exterior. Uh, we feel that these renovations um, will allow for not only a more comfortable and productive space for our employees, but also they've indica indicated that the um, that they want to uh, welcome local uh, entities and nonprofits into their building by offering communal space for their use. Um, amenities uh, such as 24 hour security and other um, uh, highlights of the building will allow staff to be more comfortable and productive, as I indicated. Um, the tenant improvements uh, contemplated for our space will be completed prior to our move-in, thereby, thereby allowing for a seamless or relatively seamless transition to our new office. And finally, the commitment to staying in Old Town Chinatown reinforces our investment and our commitment to this neighborhood. From a financial point of view, these are some of the uh, indicative lease terms. You can see that our square footage um, is a, a smaller footprint, uh, but it is an efficient footprint and it allows for a full programmatic trans, um, translation to our new space. Uh, the lease term is 132 months. This reflects a base 10 year lease plus uh, the free rent period or a lease abatement that was offered to us. 
Uh, the total rent over the lease term is approximately $13 million, which is an average of $1.182 million per year. Uh, in our financial sustainability plan, we have projected a rents and facilities expense year over year of 1.337 million, thereby uh, resulting in a projected annual savings of approximately $154,000 a year. Our next steps in this process is to, are to negotiate and finalize the lease and assemble a transition team, which would be uh, comprised of staff um, to uh, um, plan and affect uh, move logistics as well as construction oversight. I'm happy to answer any questions. In addition, our brokers are here to answer any specific questions around the lease itself or any other questions you might have. Uh, their names are Lindsay Murphy and Madison Marlton, and uh, they're at your disposal. Thank you. No? Yeah, I just want, uh, for the record, I want to declare that I have a potential conflict of interest. Um, I may have... Uh, uh, I may have money in a pension that may have money in New York life. Uh, this may not even be a potential conflict of interest. Um, I, I'm, I'm but I'm declaring this for full transparency and uh, I will participate in the discussion and the vote. Okay, thank you. So I, um, if, it's, if it's okay, I want to acknowledge that um, we have loved the building that we are in and that when we moved into this building, um, we moved into a building that was basically a project of the organization. We were 240 people. We filled all seven floors, and it has served us really well for the last 16 years. And so we want to appreciate sincerely both the Calbera family, who owned the property when we came in, as well as Beam and Ga, who are the current um, owners of this. And we are excited to be able to stay in place um, and think that it really will be fantastic to all be on one floor. One of the things that I want to highlight is that it will be very accessible. Um, oops. Um, it will be uh, accessible physically for people of all abilities, and that's incredibly important to us. And so it does feel like this is the right move, um, but we're doing it to go towards something, not because we had any, there were any um, bad feelings about this lovely space that we've been in and that we are um, I've just been really appreciative of. Thanks. Just in terms of the space itself, I thought that we just we wound up with a with slightly more space net in the new in two twenty versus here. Is that right, or am I wrong about that? Um, as we were going through the process of space planning, we were able to. Um, have a space at 220 that met all of our programmatic needs. Um, I'm not available. Take your call. Please leave a message. Uh, I think if uh, if we're looking at our current space, it's certainly um, it's less than what we currently lease. Um, but in the process of lease negotiations, we did have uh, a negotiation with our current landlord, and that would have contemplated a reduction of the footprint here, right. which would have been slightly reduced in comparison to 220. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Hello? Hello. Hi. <laughs> We're back. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, friend. friend uh, Commissioner Gambetti, do you have any questions or comments about the proposal? I, I don't think you missed very much in terms of the discussion after uh, you dropped off. No, I, I think I heard it. Um, no, I'm fine. No questions. 
Okay, great. Thank you. All right, then. Would someone like to make a motion to approve uh, resolution number 7336? So moved. Thank you. You have a second? Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Gambetti? Aye. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate it. Okay. I think that's it then. Thank you. This meeting of the Prosper Portland Board of Commissioners is now adjourned. <laughs>